Notre Dame fans, welcome back to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. And I was going to say the Recruiting Hour Podcast, and that's what most of it's going to be, but it's going to be more of like a recruiting 45 minutes today, because we're going to spend a little bit of time on some breaking news in Notre Dame Nation world, Notre Dame world, and that is that tight end George Takis has announced that he is transferring from the program. If you were paying attention on Friday's show, somebody asked us about George Takis, and I said, I'm not going to really comment on George Takis right now. This is why. Uh, we had gotten word last week that that George Takis was going to transfer. He asked us, or he Notre Dame asked us through him to keep that. You know, He wanted to break the news, and so we obviously granted him that because uh, that's what he wanted to do. So not a surprising move, Ryan. I'll be honest. I was more surprised that he initially came back than I am now that he's deciding to transfer. Right, right. I, I think that, and I mean, we were texting a little bit about it, right? Like, I think that from both sides, it makes the mm-hmm. most sense that, you know, because the obviously the over, overpopulation, if you will, if we're going to use that term for the tight end group right now, there's a lot on the roster. George Takis has the option, obviously, as a graduate transfer to take his talents to, for, to a destination. He's fulfilled his degree requirements, so he has a degree from Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be another situation where you're behind mm-hmm. Michael Mayer. And in my opinion, George Takis is talented enough where he can go to another football team and he could be the number one tight end. He could be the number one volume getter from the position, and it could help him if he has future NFL aspirations to get that film, to get that opportunity, there's, right. I think just think that from both sides, it just makes so right. much sense. Honestly, I would, I would say conservatively, and you yeah. tell me if you agree or disagree. Sure. He would start on at least half of the teams on Notre Dame schedule next year. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I think that that's, yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah, you said conservatively, yeah. but like, yeah, I, yeah. I would say so. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, you can't teach that size, right? That's yeah. There's a baseline to him. And even if right. we go and into like – And he's athletic. I mean, he's, right. he's 6'6", 255, and he's athletic, which is why Vince is so sad today. I mean, Vince is really <laughs> sad today because Vince is a big George Takis guy, you know? Yeah. And if, uh, you know, if Cam Hart would have gone pro and George Takis would have transferred, we might have had mm-hmm. to – you know, we might have had to. You know, we might have had to have an intervention for Vince. It might have. It might have. It might have gone. It might have been bad. So at least he gets one of his boys back. But no, yeah. I, I think you nailed it, Ryan. And and I think that there's two. There's two reasons why this is good for Notre Dame. Number one is it. It's not good that George is gone. I, I'm not right. saying that because that makes it seem like I don't think he's a good player. George, good kid from everything I've heard. Great kid. Yep. Uh, have a chance to meet his dad a little bit through the recruiting process. Comes from a really cool family. You know, was born. He, he was born, his mom and dad were living on campus when he was born. You know, I mean, that's a pretty cool deal. His family in Indiana. What I what I mean is it's good for him for the reasons you mentioned. Sure. But it's good for Notre Dame long term. Because mm-hmm. number one, I think with Kevin Bauman, with Mitchell Evans, with Kane Barong, with the two incoming freshmen, Holden Stace and Eli Raritan, Notre Dame is loaded at tight end, even without George Takis, right? George sure. just added another. I, the reason I was surprised that he came back is twofold. Number one, I was surprised he chose to come back initially, and I was surprised Notre Dame brought him back mm-hmm. because seven scholarship tight ends is a lot, which is something Vince and I have talked about several times on the show. Yep. The other aspect of it, too, was the concern for me is, listen, barring something crazy happening, this is the last year for Michael Mayer. My concern was you're going to go into 2023 and – all your tight ends on the roster will have been number three or worse tight ends mm-hmm. from a snap standpoint. So you would lose Mayer and most likely Takis because you can't bring him back for a sixth year in 2023, right? Like you just can't. Right. And so, I mean, you could, he would, because of COVID, he, the COVID year, he would have been able to do that, but it just wouldn't have made sense for him, for Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. So now everybody bumps up a spot whether you know now Kevin Bauman gets a chance to battle for the number two job Mitchell Evans gets a chance to battle for the number two job I think Mitchell Evans is probably the player of the returners that that most suits the role that George right. Tack has had which is sort mm-hmm. of a blocking tight end but this sure. is a big offseason for Mitchell Evans because you know he held his own last year because he's just a big tough kid 
Yeah. But Mitchell's not – he wasn't a real powerful kid, as you would expect of a converted quarterback as a true freshman in high school or college, right? So I think he needs to make big jumps this offseason in the weight room in order to kind of slide into that number two role as a blocker. And then that kind of opens up an opportunity, in my opinion, for Kevin Bauman and, and uh, Kane Barong to sort of battle for that, you know, maybe that hybrid slot, mm-hmm. you know, like wing – you know, H back slot type of tight end role. And I could see Kevin Bauman sliding into that number two role as the attached tight end, but the way that they use their number two tight end, it's not saying that I, I think Mitchell Evans is necessarily better than Kane Barong or Scott Bauman. It's more about who's whose skill set best fits how they use the number two tight end is where I'm coming from. So if you're going to play Bauman or Barong or one of the freshmen as your number two tight end, and I don't see the freshman being that right away, yeah, you kind of have to alter how you used your number two tight end, which would fit what we've talked about, meaning you have got you can't have a second tight end play 400 snaps and throw him the ball four times in the course of the year. But based on how they've used it, I think Mitchell Evans is probably the guy that makes the most sense, Ryan. Yeah, and and I mean setting it up for the future, right, is kind of the key thing that you you talked about a little bit. Because I mean, what would have been the worst case scenario is that you have the the season afterwards. We have Michael Mayer, and we have George Takis leaving at, um, at Notre Dame, and then Notre Dame's in a, in a hole just naturally. But then also, what if one of those young players is like, oh man, why am I waiting another right. year? You know what I mean? So that might right. hurt your roster construction in right. another sense. Like maybe there's you, another yeah, right. You could lose a Mitchell Evans or a Barong right. or a Bauman or whoever because they're like, well, maybe right. George comes back for a sixth year now that he's sure. You know, so so yeah, it, it that's a good point, Ryan. I didn't even think about that. You know, the yeah. fact that you know this now all these kids are bumped up a spot. Now they're all thinking, hey, I got a chance to to battle for playing time. Because the way it was looking the mm-hmm. number one and number two tight end spots were were probably sort of locked down. Sure. And, yeah, I mean, you could maybe beat out George Takis, but, uh, you know, I don't know how much – I mean, there's still a lot we've got to learn about this coaching staff. Are they going to play veterans like they have in the past? Do they err on the side of the more talented player? We don't know the answers to that. But mm-hmm. I think for George, this is good for him. I think this opens up an opportunity for him to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. play as we talked about and set himself for the NFL. It's good for Notre Dame because it allows them to have a more man. Cause here, here's the reason. So now with this move, they're down to 85 scholarships based on what we know publicly about who's coming back and, and all those type of things. Right. So they're at 85, they're going to lose some more players and they need to lose some more players. Cause I do know that Notre Dame is still looking at the transfer portal. Mm-hmm. Notre Dame normally has transfer portal success after the spring. Now there've been exceptions, Jack Cohn, Ben Skoranek sure. being exceptions, but you know, we've seen a lot of guys. Cody Riggs was a late guy. Uh, last year, Kane Madden was a late guy. Nick McLeod the year before that was a late guy. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's going to be players that, that are going to be more graduate transfer types that will jump in after the spring. That's just kind of how it goes. So Notre Dame needs to get under 85 in order to get, I mean, right now they can't add anybody. I mean, they're at 85. They can't add anybody. Yep. Lose more players and you're able to then go add people. And I think Notre Dame is still in that, that position. I, I don't anticipate any players transferring from now until the end of spring ball, or at least the beginning of spring ball. As far as we know, from a transfer standpoint, they're, they're, they're settled. Now there's some, other off the field issues with some players that always kind of pop up that could mm-hmm. could happen. But as far as this guy's up and deciding to leave, like George Takis, because George Takis' decision to transfer is a whole lot different than JoJo Johnson's decision to transfer, right? Because George's decision is him. I also want to make clear because somebody brought this up on the message board. Somebody asked, is this is an example of Notre Dame kind of nudging him out? Not at all. Notre Dame mm-hmm. wanted him back. So the backstory is. You know, George made the decision in early January to come back, surprised us a little bit. Mm-hmm. And from what I'm told and what we were told last week is he never felt great about the decision. He wanted to come back. He wanted to be with his teammates. He wanted to be with his brothers. He wanted to finish kind of what he started. But mm-hmm. he also knew he's sitting behind a generational tight end. And the only way he's going to really go be able to showcase himself is if something happens to that guy. And he he's tight with Mayer. So it's not like he... It's like, you know, you don't want to root for, you know, a guy you're cool with to get hurt, right? 
And this decision just never sat well with him. And he just, as the young guys come along and he sees a really deep room. And and I think he kind of felt from what I'm told, he felt like I need my opportunity to to shine, which I totally support. I I don't have any issue with the decision that George has made. Mm -hmm. The other part of it is I do think as the younger players emerged, I also feel like there was a comfort level with George feeling like they're going to be okay. Like I mm-hmm. think that he 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 realizes, hey, I'm not leaving Notre Dame in a bad spot now, sure. you know, and and I and I respect that, right? And so when we we kind of got word that that he was going to leave last week, we were asked to kind of hold off because the Notre Dame coaches wanted to spend the weekend trying to convince him to stay. Gotcha. So this was not a situation where they were like, hey, George, you know, out the door. No, they wanted him back. Now we could argue with the the correctness of that decision. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's a different debate. But this was not a George Tackis being nudged out the door. This was George Tackis making the best decisions for George Tackis. And I think he's making it at the right time. He's not taking away because like what he could have done, he could have gone through spring and mm-hmm. seen if things changed. Am I going to get the ball more? You know, and am I going to be a bigger part of the offense? And then if he didn't like what was happening, he could have left. That would have taken reps away from somebody else. Sure. I'm actually kind of cool with George making this decision now. We're still over a month away from spring ball. I I was told yesterday that spring ball is going to start around the 18th of March, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. So they're getting rid of, from what I understand, this could change, but what I was told is they're getting rid of that stupid practice once or twice, then go on spring break, and then come back and pick things up, which I think is just the stupidest thing ever that Brian Kelly did. Mm -hmm. So they're going to start after spring break and then just go. But I'm glad he did it this way, Ryan, and didn't wait till you know, see how things shake out in the spring, which is actually what I think the coaching staff was trying to do is like, Hey, let's get in the spring and you'll see, we're going to use you and stuff like that. And then if he decides to leave, then you've taken away hundreds of reps from whoever that next tight end is going to be. So I would have preferred him to just do it right away, but he wasn't comfortable leaving right away. And I think now he's finally comfortable leaving. And so, you know, he's got his degree, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm comfortable with, the way that George has gone about this. He needed more time to make what he felt was the best decision for himself. And he's doing it. And I know for a fact there's team. I know LSU wants him. I know for mm-hmm. a fact that's true. And there's going to be a lot of teams that are going to want George Takis. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy for him. And it's a great opportunity for Notre Dame. Anything else to add, Ryan, to this? Not, I, I was just going to say to your point that it's going to, it would have taken away, <clears throat> excuse me, some reps from players that would have, you know, if he, if it decided after the spring to make the move, it also would have taken, would have taken away an a opportunity for him to get into the spring with his new program to kind of get his footing in that direction as well. So good. Mo- I, I appreciate obviously everything that George has done for, for the university, for the program. He's been a class act, never heard anything negatively about him. Mm-hmm. Obviously he's just kind of been a worker day in and day out type mm-hmm. of player. Awesome to see what he does. Uh, LSU, you mentioned Boston college, maybe makes a little bit of sense. I think someone put it in there. I don't know if there's any interest on that, on that regard, but there's yeah, definitely they lost a lot Trey of Barry, right? Didn't they, they lose lost Trey, Trey Barry? Barry? Yep. Punter John long McNulty. two years ago, right. Trey Barry. Now John so, McNulty going in. The yep. quarterback is someone that George came in with and has exactly. worked a lot with in Phil Jacobic. Mm-hmm. You have John McNulty going there. And so, you know, I could, I could see something like that, but I do know they have like, rjg irving talking about they do have some tight ends Mm -hmm. so i don't know if that would be an ideal situation for him because he's gonna have to battle right and honestly i've always felt it's not about being afraid of competition it's about making a smart business decision when you're making a transfer decision you go where you know you're gonna play not Mm -hmm. that hey i'm gonna have to battle it's look you make that's fine but you've got a business decision to make and you got to go somewhere where you know you're going to play a bunch and get the football. Uh, but, sure. you know, BC obviously is the first one that comes to mind. LSU, I, you know, another one is like, you know, Indiana could sure use a tight end. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. a, a tight end like him, and he's got family in town. So there's a lot of options for George Tackett. There's going to be a lot of people reaching out. For sure. And the other thing, too, that we could say, too, is he – kudos to George because he a lot of tight ends in his situation would have left years ago. Mm-hmm. They never would have gotten to the point where they could wait till their senior year to play. Tight ends right. that were four-star recruits and as heavily recruited as George Takis was aren't sitting behind Tommy Tremble and Michael Mayer and, I mean, excuse me, Cole Komet and Brock Wright. And then then along comes Michael Mayer, who's like <laughs> two years younger than you are, and he beats you out the minute he steps foot on campus. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of guys would have walked out already. And George saw it through. He got his degree. And 
to me, that's the only amount of time a player owes, like, you know, owes the college, you know, yeah. like he got his degree after that. It's you got to do what's best for you. So huge, huge respect for, for George Tech is for seeing it through. And, you know, again, he didn't touch the ball a lot last year, but he's a pretty important part of the offense. I mean, he played a lot of football. He had over 400 snaps. So uh, he, mm-hmm. he clearly brought a lot of value. Yeah. For so sure. Ryan, and, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no you're good. I was going to say, let's transition to some recruiting yep. conversation, right? Let's do it. So today we're going to, we're going to have some fun today, a little bit of fun today. We're going to, we're going to kind of answer some questions about who's on the board for Notre Dame while also talking mm-hmm. about sort of as we really dive headfirst into the 2023 class, because the 2022 class is now officially signed, sealed and delivered. Yeah. Uh, there's no potential for any 2022 kids. We're really going to dive into the 2023 class. We're going to have some stuff on the website about, you know, we're going to start working on our big boards. I'm, I'm working on Intel on who's definitely on the board and Ryan's calling kids all the time. We're going to have more junior days coming up. So really going to have a ton going on, but we kind of wanted to go over sort of a, a bit of a combination of a needs article, right? Along with sort of what would be the early dream class for Notre Dame. And we're going to kind of have a, a two twofold approach on it. Number one is just sort of, I think the fun one of doing it, which is like, here's what the dream class would be for Notre Dame. So like if, if we could get any kid that we want, here's who we would put in the class for Notre Dame. And then also sort of an ideal class, which is a little bit more realistic of this is what it could look like if things really go well. And, and so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to spend some time doing that. We'll go position by position, talk about the need, talk about the players that Ryan and I really see as, as, uh, legitimate candidates for Notre Dame and, and guys that we think Notre Dame can get. Some are going to be harder than others. And then at the end, he picked, what is it, about four questions. Uh, we may we may not get to one of them. Uh, you know, that last one, I don't know, Ryan, if I'm going to be able to get to that one. But, you know, one thing we're going to kind of add is, you know, he does a recruiting mailbag on, at irishbreakdown.com every Monday. And it's questions that we answer from Irish Breakdown subscribers only. And so he's going to pick, you know, three or four each week and just to kind of answer and Really, today, the whole show is going to be kind of built around that premise because one of the questions in the mailbag was about the sort of the dream class, Ryan. So Mm -hmm. let's start with offense, Ryan. We're going to start with the offensive recruiting class for 2023. We'll go position by position, kind of talk about the needs and then what that ideal class is. And, of course, we've got to start a quarterback. I think one is the need. If you're going to take a second quarterback, you take one later. It's got to be more of an athlete type of guy, you know, guy that can play quarterback, but, you know, is also – a guy that can maybe play another position or a kid who just wants to be at Notre Dame, you know, just a depth guy that understands, Hey, you're not coming in here to necessarily battle, which is those that's hard to find. You don't, you don't have many kids like that that are also good enough to be at Notre Dame and provide the depth that they need. So I think one is the target. And one thing you and I have in common, Ryan, there's one guy that stands above everybody else when it comes to dream class, ideal class must get whatever adjective, whatever, you want to put on it, and that is Dante Moore. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's perfect preface. And, and first and foremost, shout out to at D Mulligan, uh, D, D Mulligan and D13, who was the one that submitted this question for this week's mailbag. So quarterback, it starts and it ends with Dante Moore at this point, right? I mean, there are other guys that have been talked about. Some of the offers, of course, um, talk about a guy like Jackson Arnold um, out there in Texas. We talk about guys like Christopher Vizina down in Alabama, uh, Avery Johnson out there in Kansas. That's kind of what the board looks like right now. But for me, and I know Brian agrees with me, it starts and it ends with Dante Moore because this is the needle mover. This is the table setter, not just from a on-field perspective of being that quarterback that literally does set everything and is table setting from a quarterback perspective, but the, the, the questions about early on about what this wide receiver room is going to look like, what this offensive line room is going to look like. This is where the conversation starts to take shape because getting a guy like a Dante Moore is about a needle mover of a move that you can have early on in the process. And it, people, a lot of people have been asking about timeline for a guy with a Dante Moore. It is going to be, and Brian has gone very in depth about this in the past. He understands that he needs to get into a class to really make waves and to be able to set that class. But also he is a very well-spoken, very smart kid 
who is taking the time to do his due diligence on all his schools. So it's not going to be the longest time frame. You should expect some time during the summer before the senior season. But he is the guy for me that is, if there's a can't-miss player in this class for me, this Mm -hmm. is the can't-miss player of the uncommitted players. Notre Dame has to make waves, especially with all the noise surrounding Michigan right now. Obviously, one of the leaders outside of Notre Dame up there at Michigan State with, with the uncertainty over... Jim Harbaugh interviewing, now coming back. Now that now Josh Gaddis heads down to Miami. There's movement in that offensive room, right? The head coach, Notre Dame needs to continue to make waves with Dante Moore because this is the guy that they really need that could jumpstart this offensive class for Notre Dame. I, I like your can't miss aspect of it. I mean, if there is such yeah. a thing, he would be on my list of can't miss players just because it's not just the physical skills of Dante. It's It's this here as well. Mm-hmm. I did a just kind of break down, you know, people's there was a conversation on the message board this weekend about, you know, when's he going to come in? And people are saying he's mm-hmm. going to take it into the season. And I said, I'd be shocked by that. Number one, because Dante said the opposite. He right. has said, look, I have to balance me making the right decision for me, which should always be his number one, pro- a kid's number one priority. Absolutely. But also understand that I'm a key to whatever class I'm going to, whatever team I'm going to join, I'm a key to, to that roster getting built up correctly. Mm-hmm. So I, I would be surprised if it goes past July is, is really where I'm at. And I could see him doing something sooner than that. But I, so what I did was I went the last three years and took the top 10 quarterbacks in each class. Mm-hmm. And when they committed and some of them decommitted and signed later, but just when kids initially committed to the schools that they, that they wanted to go to. And I think it was something like 27 of the 30 committed before the end of July of, of their senior going into their senior seasons. And it was something like 22 committed before the end of, what was it, April? Something like that, right? So the vast majority of court, to back up Ryan's point, the vast majority of big-time quarterbacks understand, yes, I have to make the right decision for me, but I have to make sure, make it, there is a little bit more of an expediency to this thing. And and to kind of back up of the whole point of what we're discussing today, if you get Dante Moore, Mm-hmm. The ideal class, the dream class, is a lot more achievable yes. than if you don't get him. Because of that, what we're just talking about, he is he is sort of the, whether you want to call him the the the, the Pied Piper, the ringleader, whatever the class may be, whatever the, 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 the term may be, he is it. Mm-hmm. He is that guy. And we've seen it in the past. I mean, when, when Notre Dame has signed big-time quarterbacks in the past, you see other players want to jump on board. <clears throat> We had somebody somebody brought up, he said, uh, well, you know, when Jimmy Clausen signed, you didn't see a bunch of big time players sign up. And I was like, what? <laughs> Armando and Allen and Robert Hughes in his class were top 100 players. The next year in 2018, they got a top 100 back in Jonas Gray. And the next year after that, got a top 100 back in Sierra Wood. They signed five star Duval Kamar and Golden Tate in Jimmy's class, along with Mike Ragone, who's a top 100 player. The next year, they signed five star wide receiver Michael Floyd and five star tight end Kyle Rudolph. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. They they kind of did follow, you know, big time players follow Jimmy, uh, or and you saw kind of what happened with with Phil Dracovic with Kevin Austin in the class that they ended up signing, which to some degrees hasn't necessarily panned out. But a lot of guys mm-hmm. wanted to play with Phil. Big time players want to play with big time quarterbacks, especially ones who are like Dante, who he's not a real outspoken and outgoing guy, but he's a guy that's connected and talks to kids. He's involved with other players, and. Like like you had talked about, we've we've talked about on the show in the past. Brian Smith has talked about. Trust me, everybody, everybody in the country knows who Dante Moore is. Every yeah. player in the country that can take a handoff or catch a pass knows who Dante Moore is. And he's one of those, you know, three or four guys who's like, yeah, I'd like to play with that guy, along with like a Malachi Nelson and you know, like Arch Manning, guys like that that are considered the big name quarterbacks. So, yes, mm-hmm. if you want to get a dream class, this dream class we're going to talk about today, getting Dante Moore in the class is a is a great way to start that off, right? Yeah. Well, no, no I think uh, the, the the subtle confidence is what I would call it with a guy like a Dante Moore, right? Mm-hmm. Like he just exudes it. And, mm-hmm. and I think that the perfect segue is if anybody – if there's a position that has been the main talking point outside a quarterback, I would say wide receiver recruiting has been something that has been questioned – not only on these recruiting hours or the or the mailbags on Friday, but it's always been a hot topic of discussion over the last couple of boards on this on the uh, premium discussion board. So, 
I put down, I thought wide receiver was the second most important position offensively. From a volume perspective, it is probably the most important because we keep talking about the fact that, hey, after next season, Avery Davis, Braden Lindsay, Joe Wilkins Jr., they're out of the room and the room's already small right now, mm -hmm. right? So there is a volume need and there's also just continuing to add very talented players. There's talent that's being influxed into there like Tobias Merriweather in this past class with the guys like Lorenzo Styles and, and you know, some of the really talented. Deion Colsey. Yeah. Deion Colsey, Jane Thomas. Like they've done a good job at the position. It's just that there's not a high volume. And I think that right. they still, they especially need to add, in my opinion, a little bit of speed to this position, right? right? That yeah. is like the big need for me. Well, I'll so. say the big thing for me with the, when you talk about the wide receiver position, it's they're going after a different type of kid in this class. And now mm -hmm. what I mean by that is not a different type of kid from what they've done in the past. Like they're changing the offense, but more of uh, they're going after different types of kids in this class. Mm -hmm. And you know, you've got a Cardinal Tate who's, you know, a six, two smooth can do a little bit of everything type of player. I, I've compared him to a bigger, faster version of DeVars Daniels is if you're looking for a Notre Dame comp, you know, uh, he will be a good route runner. I mean, just can do it all. Then you've got like the big receivers, like a Malik Elzey that they're going after. And, mm -hmm. and there's guys in that mold of a Carnell Tate, Tyler Williams, I think kind of falls in that mold. Then you have some smaller, really dynamic athletes that they're really pushing for in this class. Rodney Gallagher, who I know you love Jalen yeah. Brown, uh, Caden Lee is a kid that they're, they're recruiting and pushing, you know, starting to, starting to kind of work for. So, when when you look at at it, Ryan, they mm -hmm. you're, we're finally kind of seeing what we've said for years, which is they can't just recruit like one type of guy. You've got to mix it up, and you've got to bring in different types, and that's a that's kind of what we're seeing. So let's let's kind of talk a little bit about you know what would that ideal that ideal class. Another big guy that they're after is Braylon James. I forgot. I, I if we're going to mention receivers that they're after, he's one. Kyle Casper at six five from Arizona. Mm -hmm. You know, there's big guys like that, and then there's you know Tyler Williams is a six five guy, but Tyler Williams is big, but he's mm -hmm. not a big receiver. Like he's not Miles Boykin. He is smooth. You know, yeah. and and I like his game. And then you know Jaden Great Great House is sort of a CJ Williams type of player. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and and then you've got your know, Rico Flores is kind of a fast playmaker type. You've got uh, Jalen Brown. We've talked about Rodney Gallagher. We've talked about. So I really like the board right now. Mm -hmm. yep. But when you look at it and say, okay, who are the Ronan Hannafin? We should have talked about him as well. We talk yep. about like an ideal class. Let's first talk about numbers. I think sure. three is the minimum mm -hmm. that you have to take. And if the right four want to come, I'm taking four. Honestly, and and I'll, I'm gonna go really out here. I'm gonna go really out here. Okay, I'd be I'd be willing to take five if one of those five includes Ronan Hannafin. Fair, because Fair. of his positional flexibility. Fair. Meaning, you know, you can you can put him at so many other places to help out if you fall short somewhere. But I think you start getting into five in one class. That's too many, in my view. That's like. You know, now you hurt your numbers for 2024 class. But if I, I, I would be willing to go for five if it's like you've got four guys, one of them is Ronan Hannafin, and all of a sudden Jalen Brown decides in January that he wants to come to Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Here's your NIL, you know, NIL, you know, here's your, you know, it's, you know, I mean, not NIL, sorry, NLI, right? National mm -hmm. Letter of Intent, which is going to get yep. super confusing now with NIL <laughs> and NLI, uh, his letter of intent. So, I mean, he, if you if a dude wants to come late and to get you to five, then you just take that dude and you figure it out, right? But I think three to four is mm -hmm. three being the minimum, four being the ideal. Do you agree with that number breakdown? Yes, yeah. I had um so in the the article, I had three guys written because I actually had Ronan Hannafin listed at, on the defensive side of the football, right? So that's kind of a like I, I wanted to just list him as an athlete, to be honest, and just kind of mm -hmm. use it as the caveat. Like he is going to start at wide receiver most likely when he gets to Notre Dame, but he could also fit if into he safety. Dame, right. If he picks Notre Dame, he would fit most likely early on as a wide receiver, but he has the flexibility, like you said, to potentially fit as a safety um, rover type uh, for the team as well. So the three, though, that I – highlighted in the article that I think would be great gets potentially for Notre Dame. And I think fit is a great conversation because I pick, I picked three kit, three young men for, in the class that I think skill sets 
really mesh well together. And you mentioned, obviously, Carnell Tate with the tall, smooth. He's got kind of that longer frame, can do some things in the air, as well as as a route runner, has enough speed to threaten vertically. Like, he just kind of checks a lot of boxes as an all-around wide receiver. And I think that he's a kid that could play X. He could play some Z. He could move up around all over the place. And then I wanted to couple that with a little bit of speed. I know we talked about Jalen Brown, who is out th- uh, down there in Miami, who is a dynamic, dynamic mover. He brings the speed element that outside of Braden Lindsay really isn't not on the roster right now, mm-hmm. right? Like they need Notre Dame needs to be able to really pull in this type of playmaking speed, I believe. So we got a little more of the size in Cornell all around game. We got Jalen Brown, who's got the speed element. And then the last guy, like you kind of talked about, was Rodney Gallagher. Now, he's a little bit of a tough um, a tough projection for some because he plays option quarterback, right? Like he is a wildcat quarterback, and that's just what his necess- uh, necessity is out there in Pennsylvania. And, but he is a guy for me that I think slot Z type where he – I think he's dynamic in space. We're talking about the yard after catch type of receiver. This kid has great field position. Got great quickness, but I also think that he has plus speed as well. Now, he's not a Jalen Brown in terms of speed, but I think that he could stretch the field as well. And all those three players together, I think, would make an outstanding class because I think their skill sets are all different, but yeah. I think it would mesh really well. I think to your point, if if I'm going to use comps, right, that's what people yep. like to make this point. We've talked about Carnell. Jalen Brown, to me, is very much a Will Fuller type of player. Mm-hmm. meaning he's going to stretch the top, take the top off the defense. You know, a guy that's – I'd say he's kind of part Will Fuller, part Devontae Smith, right, in, in that how he plays. He's got he's got Will Fuller-type speed, yep. but he's got Devontae-type route running potential and those type of things. Now, he's still a bit of a raw player, but the tools are there. And then Rodney Gallagher, to me, is more of sort of like that modern high, hybrid slot player, meaning you can put him in the backfield on one snap, You can Mm -hmm. do wildcat quarterback stuff with him. You can get him on jets. You can get him on reverses. And then, of course, he can work the middle of the field and and quick game and screen and things like that. But he also has the speed to stretch the field when that time comes. And so that part of his game is going to have to evolve because he hasn't done it. But Mm -hmm. the tools are there. And so there's that vertical stretch the field type player in Jalen Brown who can also turn a crossing route into a touchdown. But then there's that guy in, in Gallagher that is a make you miss type of guy. So, you know, if you, if you, you know, whose game probably Jalen uh, Brown most fits at Notre Dame as exactly. opposed to Will Fuller, you know, it's probably better fit as Kevin Stefferson. It's fair. Like, it's fair. Yeah. And, and more explosive than Kevin was, which is mm-hmm. saying something, Kevin, you know. Kevin was explosive. Yeah. yeah but both, like similar body type. Kid. Yeah. Smooth. Like Will was just kind of. <laughs> You know, yeah. Kevin was the kind of guy that could catch a crossing route and he was smooth. He could run a reverse. And and I think it's it's that body type. But Jalen is a much more mature young man yeah. and completely different personality from Kevin Stefferson. But just on the field, very mm-hmm. similar body type in game where Rodney Gallagher is more of a shifty type of guy, make you miss kind of guy. And and so if you're going like, to line those up, it's Cardinal at the W. It's mm-hmm. it's uh, it's Jalen Brown at X and it would be Rodney Gallagher and at Z. That would be sort of how they play together. Uh, yeah. So that would be one heck of a trio. For me, I look at it like you've got to get Tate, right? That's the guy you've got to get. Yeah. If I'm being somewhat realistic with my ideal class, I'd say you have to get one of Jalen Brown or Rodney Gallagher. You have to get one of them. Like in the perfect dream mm-hmm. class is you get both of them, right? And sure. then you add a fourth guy to that. If I'm talking more of an ideal, like what would make a top three to four class that's somewhat realistic, it's you got to get Cardinal Tate and you got to get one of those two guys. It's going to be tough to get both of them. If they get both of them, Chancey Stucky immediately deserves a raise, and so does Tommy Reese, right, Mm -hmm. for getting that one done. And then after that, as sort of that third guy, there's a group of bigger players, and you got to get one of them. And it's Malik Elzey, it's Ronan Hannafin, and it's not in any particular order. It's Tyler Williams, and it's Kyle Casper. You got to get one of those four big guys, right? Yeah. I think that's kind of and, and Braylon James is the other one that you throw in that category. Like the mm-hmm. that six four, six three, six four guy that, that's kind of a more traditional W. Because I personally would much rather see Cardinal Tate at X than W. Like if, if mm-hmm. he's gonna fit in one spot. Now, everybody knows I want to see guys playing everywhere, right? Sure. I don't like the whole just put him in one, plug him and play at one spot. 
But if you're going to start, you have to start somewhere. I would rather Cardinal start at X and they build the offense more of around what it looked like in 2015 when it was mm-hmm. more of an X slot driven offense than it was a boundary driven offense. Because if you look at the number of touches that Will Fuller and, and Amir Carlisle got, in 2015, mm-hmm. plus with the running back coming out of the backfield. I mean, Chris Brown was the W that year. He was the boundary guy. Now, occasionally will go there, but, you know, Chris Brown had 48 catches, but, you know, Will Fuller had 62. Uh, Amir Carla had 31. And then Torrey Hunter played a lot in the slot as well that year, and he had 28 catches. So you mm-hmm. had a ton of field slot produ- pr- production that year. I would like to see Notre Dame get a little bit more balance towards that, not so much the the boundary W dominant pass game that we've seen so much in recent years. Yeah, but of that W position, I think you know LZ Williams, Casper Hannafin, Braylon James all fit that a lot better in my view than than even than Carnell Tate does. Who I like to me, if you get Carnell Tate and you're not moving him around everywhere, you're not you're not doing it right. I mean, you're right. you're not doing it right, and and my understanding is that's the pitch. So I think that would be sort of my, my dream class. And then just to, you know, a fourth guy from one of those, you know, if you get two of those big guys, that's fine. Uh, because I think some of them can do other things like Ronan Hannafin can play defense. He can play, he can do other things. You know, Tyler Williams, even though he's a six, five guy can play boundary, but can also play X, mm-hmm. you know, Kyle Casper can do some unique things. And Elsie's the only guy that I see is a pure W right. in that group. But if, if, if you get Tate, and then one of Brown and Gallagher, and then let's just say two of that other group. That's mm-hmm. one heck of a receiver class. It really yeah. is. I personally wouldn't mind seeing the fourth guy either be a Hannafin type dual threat athlete or a Caden Lee, who's a kid from Georgia that hasn't been offered yet, but he's a smaller guy. And the reason I say that is if you only get one of those faster, short, smaller guys, then you're pinning him with Tate and bigger guys and then Tobias Merriweather. I'd mm-hmm. like to see a second sort of dynamic type of player. So if you only get one of Brown or or, or um, uh, Gallagher, then I'd like to see them go after a Caden Lee type of player as that as that next receiver in the class. That's just my two cents on that. Yeah. Well, no, I, I think Caden's a really interesting player, and I think it's paramount that they try that they Notre Dame potentially hit on a Jalen Brown or Rodney Gallagher for a huge reason. Is I, I think we talk about you know kind of what we're moving towards, right? Those yak receivers, those guys that can create things after catch, especially if we, if, if Notre Dame does implement a lot more RPO looks than we're, that we're anticipating those quick glances, those arrow routes to get in the ball in space quickly. I think that is paramount to the business because you just don't really have that right now, but those types of players do bring that potential to the offense. I'd say you have two that can do that. And that's Lindsay and styles. Sure. Right. Sure. But Lindsay's yeah. going to be gone. But see, here's the thing. When we're talking about the 2023 class, there's only one on the roster that they're going to play with. Exactly. Lindsay's going to be gone. Yep. And so you need at least two, right? Mm-hmm. You need at least two on the roster. I think Notre Dame has two now. And I think that they're going to be down to one after this year. And it's not that it's not that Tobias Mer- Merriweather and Deion Colsey can't make plays in the RPO game. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when we saw from Lorenzo Styles this year, who was at North Carolina, they just threw him a little quick look screen and he makes one guy miss and he's off. Yeah. Maybe it was USC, one of those two games. You know, he he made that kind of play. We saw what he did in the in the in the the Fiesta Bowl, right? Where yeah. he has over 100 yards. And I think four of his six catches at least were on RPOs, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, being able to catch and do something after. So I think that's a really good point. You've got to get one of those two guys. You got to get Cardinal Tate, you got to get one of those two players. And yep. that would be a phenomenal, phenomenal foundation to build around. And then anybody you add from that list, that that's a good list of players. After a bonus that. at that point. Anybody yeah. you add after that, so it's it's a, it's hitting it. Offensive yep. line's an interesting one, Ryan. I think needs mm-hmm. wise, three is the minimum, assuming mm-hmm. you keep the current roster intact. You don't yep. have any transfers. I mean, Josh Lug's going to be gone. Jared Patterson's going to be gone. That'll get you down to fourteen. Mm-hmm. In you know, maybe you don't bring back all your fifth years, but you know, you could. I think you're at that point now where three is really the minimum because you have signed five each of the last two classes. As long mm-hmm. as you don't have any departures from that group, three is you if you get the right three, I'm like, okay, that, that they're good, right? I mm-hmm. think four is sort of the ideal number to get to. 
So let's yeah. talk about what your dream scenario would be if if Harry Heastan just flat out knocks this offensive line thing out of the park in this class. I have a feeling I know for sure who two of your guys are going to be. But let me yeah. hear who your who your class is going to be. Well, I think the top guy on the board, if I were Notre Dame, would be Samson Okunlola, the offensive tackle out of uh, Massachusetts that we've talked heavily about on this show, the last couple of shows specifically. For me, this is our Ronnie Stanley moving forward, right? This is the mm-hmm. bona fide left tackle moving forward. And again, offensive line recruiting, we're talking about guys that can mesh together, not necessarily the four best left tackles. We need guys that can potentially also move to different spots if you're Notre Dame. So Okanlola would be the first guy. The guy that I'm really high on, uh, maybe more than most. I mean, I know he's a top 50 recruit by by some platform. So I'm not sitting here and say that people are low on him, but Monroe Freeling's a guy for me mm-hmm. from North Carolina that I, I mean, the movement skills I think are just really tantalizing, right? Like mm-hmm. he could also, in my opinion, be that left tackle down the road, but he's a true tackle. I don't see him fitting inside. He has that developmental frame. He's a really gifted athlete. I know Harry Heastan has been out there to watch him play basketball just to see how he moves. And he is a gifted basketball player too, on top of being the, the football player that he is. So that would be a slam dunk for Notre Dame. Oaken Lola and Freelink potential as your bookends down the line, I think would be an awesome fit. I have ideally, again, this one has been trending obviously in a, in a different direction. Notre Dame is trying to get back on the forefront here, but Luke Montgomery would be a guy that I would obviously take. He's been a guy that, that everyone thought defensive line was kind of where he leaned early, but the reports now, according to Sean and um, just everything that we're hearing is that he actually sees himself and his family sees himself on the offensive side of the football. And he's more, he has enough length where I think he could play offensive tackle, but for me, this is a guard. He's a physically mm-hmm. imposing player that really gets off the ball. And his high school coach sees that too, Ryan. I mean, that's what his yeah. high school coach told Sean is that we think he's mm-hmm. a, a guard at the next yeah. level. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that I think part of it is like functional athleticism and length. He could probably last an offensive tackle at the next level, but there's also just a temperament to how players play sometimes that kind of moves them inside, right? So I think that Luke Montgomery for Notre Dame would be obviously a, a huge get. Again, don't think that that one's necessarily in a great spot currently, but Notre Dame is going to work their their tails off to get back into this one over the next couple of months because it's going to be paramount. And then a guy that I think is, and Brian's talked about a little bit, Charles J- uh, Jagasa, offensive mm-hmm. tackle, who is an incredibly talented football player. You could tell me that he may be an offensive tackle long-term as well, but he's got the kind of frame where I think he is literally played four different positions. I think that they could play him at a high level. Now, he is raw, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But with Harry Heastan coming aboard, the ability to work with this type of length, this type of athleticism, this type of raw power – this kid could be maybe the highest upside offensive lineman yeah. that I've mentioned in this in this group yeah. right here. And this is just seems like a guy that would be perfect to develop under Harry Heastan. He's a Harry Heastan special, man. <clears throat> yep. I mean, he really is. Now, part of the reason he's raw, just for some backstory, obviously being from the state of Illinois, he didn't play a sophomore season of mm-hmm. football. So he missed a whole year of development. And Sean had a really cool story at Irish Breakdown about this. So there was a lot of people trying to get him to transfer. So – where Charles lives, he lives right on the border of Iowa. So yeah. he's like in Western Illinois. And a lot of teammates and a lot of kids from his area transferred to to Iowa as sophomores so they could play their sophomore year. But Charles felt he needed to be a leader and, and he wanted to be loyal to his school and his, you know, the new coach that they were you know, working on. And so he decided to stay, which meant he missed a sophomore year, which meant he's a little bit behind, behind from a development standpoint. But man, the tools are there. He has no idea what he's doing footwork wise. I also love the fact he's a really good wrestler. And I have always, we don't see it as much now as we did 10, 15 years ago, where it used to be like almost every great offensive lineman was a wrestler. But now kids are doing camps and playing basketball and all this other kind of stuff. But he is a wrestler and I love wrestlers. And he's another one of those guys that I, I flat out think he could play right tackle at the next level. But sure. along with what you said about Luke Montgomery, could be a guy that maybe the temperament is mm-hmm. better suited for guard, uh, but could play both. But yeah, he is absolutely a, a Harry He Stand special, Ryan. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, so I think you're, those. You're I was four, just gonna say, I, I okay. think those four guys, right? They all have mm-hmm. tackle backgrounds, which kind of fits mm-hmm. into the he Harry He Stand logic as well. But mm-hmm. we're gonna make those four guys fit potentially down the road, which I think a couple mm-hmm. of them have some versatility to move to a different position, also. I've kind of I've kind of written off Montgomery a little bit. Just okay. I like his film. 
right? Yeah. There's no doubt about it, but I just kind of feel mm-hmm. like I just I've never felt great about that one ending up for Notre Dame. And and it's fair. So I'm he's not on my he's not on my list for that reason. My four is the first three are the same as yours. Samson Okalol is number one on my board. Monroe mm-hmm. Freeling and Charles Jagasaw are like one B and one C. Like yep. to me, you if you can somehow start your class off with those three guys, that's that that if, if that's all they got and they didn't get a fourth, like as I said, three's the minimum. I'm like, all right, cool. Because as you said, all three of those guys can play tackle and can play guard. Mm-hmm. And and guard meaning not that they are guards, but mm-hmm. as we've seen with Harry He stand throughout his tenure at Notre Dame is taking guys who can play tackle and could be really good tackles and then saying, hey, look, but the best way to get this guy on the field is to put him a guard or center, mm-hmm. even which we've seen. So Samson Okunlola is my – is I mean, he's just a dude. Freeling is a is a really rare type of mover. I mean, he yes. just – the way he moves at 6'7 is just not – something you see often it's that if you if, if you somehow get those two guys there will not be a team in the country that has a more athletic pair of guys in the top and then you throw in Jagasaw Jagasaw I mean he is a tough kid also athletic the thing with him is there's going to be some plays where he doesn't look overly athletic because his technique is so bad sure. and then there's other plays especially on defense where you're like whoa like okay yeah I see it now <laughs> so he is a really unique kid. And then after that, if the, you're going to get a fourth, you know, if, if I'm not looking at Luke Montgomery, don't take this as I'm not saying I would, if Luke Montgomery was to come to Notre Dame, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, I don't see it happening. If yeah. you can get a fourth from the group of Chase Basantis, Sullivan mm-hmm. Absher, and Austin Searveld, uh, that's a heck of an offensive line class to me. For sure. Yeah. Right. And you could always expand the board. There's going to be kids coming along, but it's got to start with that three. If, the, if, if, if there's going to be a, a dream Notre Dame class, it's got to include Okalola, Freeling, and Jagasa. It's got to include those three guys, in my opinion. You can't yeah. have one without them. Well, I, re- I really like, and I know we were texting a little bit about Sullivan Absher before we got on here. He's, for me, like he's he plays with outstanding pad level for a guy mm-hmm. as tall as he is. He fires off the football, and he plays with a nasty temperament. You want to talk about another guy that could move inside a guard? Like I think that's that type of dude for Sullivan Absher as well. I had a I had somebody tell me once that they thought he was a guard, and this was before I'd seen him. Right, and I was like, I, I was like, there's yeah. no way that kid at six seven can play. I mean, it's I, it's I don't like six seven guys a guard. I don't. And yeah. but then I'm like, okay, hold on, let me watch the film before I lose my mind. Mm-hmm. And you know, I see him, and I'm like, okay, he's got the like you said, he plays with really good pad level, which is why I've kind of yeah. always liked Josh Lug at guard. I think Josh Lug, when he's healthy and his back's not messed up plays with much better pad level of guard than he does at tackle, in mm-hmm. my opinion. And yep. so you do have the rare six seven kid that can play guard like a Josh Lug, but my gut reaction to six seven kids being a guard is <laughs> can he just not move? Right. But no, you're <laughs> it's the pad level and the demeanor, yeah. how he plays are the two reasons that I think you're right. He could he's a right tackle guard prospect, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. That if he, I, he's, I, you know, I, I think functionally he's a good athlete. Like he mm-hmm. can last a tackle right. for sure. I just, just just when I was watching him at right tackle, even just down blocking, mm-hmm. I'm like that just looks like a guard yeah. to me. Like he's he just quick. fires off the football, yeah. really good. I mean, initial quickness is good. He's got plays a great pad level. Like I, I just really yeah. like a lot what I saw. And then I know we had someone that asked about Chase Basantis, right? Like I, I for me, that's a prototype guard, right? right? Like that is the dude for me because right. he is. Another tackle at Don Bosco Prep here in he's New got, Jersey. He's got tackle length, though, but you're right. He does. He's a college guard, but he's got Absolutely. tackle length, and that's the ideal. That's what you're looking yep. for. Yep, and he's a, he's a super physical kid. Uh, like, he, he's one of those phone booth nasty guys, right? Like, he wants Just to say beat it, Ryan. you up. He, is he wants to take you in the back alley, kid, man. Right? Hey. If, 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 if I were to stereotype what a Jersey lineman should look like, right? Like, a little bit nasty. Maybe sometimes a little past the whistle, right? Just yep. wants to fight you, just wants to get you in a back alley and brawl with you until you can't move anymore. That's how Chase Basantis plays football. I mean, is that a fair thing? I mean, he is a Jersey lineman. I mean, and he's from yeah. Jersey, obviously, so it makes sense. But he's yep. the prototypical – he's what you expect to get from the, the Northern Jersey Catholic League, right? I mean mm-hmm. – that's what you expect to get. And 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 that's a that's all said in complimentary fashion. You know what yeah. I mean? He's Absolutely. a guard center because I think he moves well enough to where he could maybe be a center down the road. Yeah. Like he's got that, yeah. you know, he'd have to learn to snap and step with power, but 
he mm-hmm. has the traits that I think you because he's not super long either. And I no. get real nervous about super long centers. I kind of feel like they're mm-hmm. like quarterbacks. You know, the longer your arms are, the more there is to your to your mm-hmm. motion. He's got yeah. he also doesn't have real short stubby arms either. He's got that really yeah. good interior length and build that I think could work. So you give me yeah. one of those guys like Absher, Basantis to go with the top three. That's one heck of an offensive line class, Ryan. There's yep, no doubt absolutely. about it. Yep, yep. And they I think they all fit really well together, which is makes it even better. So those uh those guys, yeah. I, I mean it, it it looks early on, and I know we don't have uh Notre Dame doesn't have any commits in the class right yeah. now, but they are in a good position for yeah. several very talented offensive linemen in yeah. this cycle so far. I would say right now, Freeling and Jagasa are 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 Notre Dame's more towards the very top of their list than mm-hmm. Oak and Lola. Would you say that's fair? Now yep. they're in the top group, I would say, with all of them. Don't get me yes. wrong, but I feel like Oak and Lola, Ohio State's been on him longer. He's yeah. shown more affinity to some of the southern schools than most northeastern kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, Notre Dame's going to have to battle for him. They're in it, but it's going to be more of a battle. I feel from talking to you and some mm-hmm. of my other sources that you could argue if Notre Dame's not the leader, they're in the lead group with both Freeling and Jagasa. Would you say that that's accurate? Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, definitely Freeling. Every time I talk to him, he just, I mean, he just, everything I post on Twitter about Notre Dame, he likes. Every time I talk to him, he's just <laughs> raving about, you know, his recent conversation with with uh, Coach Eastan and the excitement for Notre Dame. So I think that that, that, uh, that interest is very mutual in that regard as well. And I would even throw Sullivan Absher, I think, is very heavy on Notre Dame, right? Like, they're, yeah. they're, it's going to be a nice battle with him. Um, and with, I mean, honestly, with Freeling as well, because they're both North Carolina kids, and I think all those Carolina schools are heavy on them. Both, you know, Clemson's of the world and North Carolinas, they're mm-hmm. they're heavy on to those kids. Um, so I, I think that, but I think that Notre Dame is in very good spot for Jagasaw, like you said, definitely for Freeling, and I think that they're in a good spot for Absher as well. Yep. If that's who they like. Yep. I hear. I heard a cool story this weekend. I was talking to a parent, and I think they'll be okay with me sharing the story. But um, I guess the offensive linemen have so far, the freshmen have been raving about their experience with Coach Eastan. Obviously mm-hmm. demanding and hard on me. Says, but they, he's, every morning they get up and there's a text message from Coach Eastan with some sort of motivational quote and some sort of like positive quote to kind of get their day started. So um, That's awesome. those are the things that we, when people say, like, why do the players love him so much when he's so freaking hard on them in practice? <laughs> it's that stuff. Right. Right. And that's why kids sign up for it, knowing they know what they're getting. Like Harry, he stands not one of those guys that like pretends like he's this really sweet, nice guy. And then once they show up, they just crush him, which a lot, you know, a lot of coaches do that. He's very honest about who he is and his players are very honest about who he is. But that's one thing is like, look, the cussing on practice for two hours is completely, you know, you, you you're fine with it because of it's the other stuff. Right. And so I thought that was pretty cool. So, yeah, it would be nice for see him have a splash after, you know, I think what this cl- let me ask you this question, Ryan. Yeah, we both like the 2022 offensive line class. I mean, top to bottom, it is the mm-hmm. deepest Notre Dame class they've had since probably 2013, where your fourth or fifth guy are starting caliber players potentially. Right. Mm-hmm. Whereas the year before 2021, you had more at the top. I mean, there's nobody in 2022 as good as Blake Fisher. Right. But, mm-hmm. you know, four or five, maybe not quite as good. Yeah. I would argue that if they get Oak and Lola, Freeling, and Jagasaw, and then one of the players we mentioned, that's mm-hmm. an even better class than the one they just signed. Because I would argue there's more top-level talent. You know what well, I mean? Um, yeah. well, that's another well, that's example what... from a family member of, of Andrew Kristoffic, by the way. Awesome. So it says, for those uh, on the podcast, it says, Harry Heastan wrote a – this is from John Kristoffic. Thank you for sharing this, John. Harry Heastan wrote a letter to Andrew Kristoffic's father to tell him that he was looking forward to coaching Andrew. That's awesome. So, who he initially recruited to Notre Dame before he left, by the way. So that's, you know, again, that's the stuff. And Harry Heastan personally wrote a, a, a letter to all 32 NFL teams for Robert Hainsey last year. He had not coached Robert Hainsey since 2017. Ryan, you know this to be true. You heard this. He literally wrote a wrote a personal letter to all 32 teams advocating for for Robert. Hainsey. I'm 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 pretty sure he did it for Kramer and Eichenberg too, but I I wasn't told mm-hmm. that directly. I was told directly that he did it for Hainsey. But that's sure. the kind of stuff he does. Um, yeah. you know, that that's what he does. But I would say that if they signed that group of four, that would be better and that's just class because 
I think there's more elite level talent in this group than there is in that group, especially at tackle. Because in my yes. opinion, Notre Dame's two best offensive linemen in last year's class are both interior guys. You yeah. know, now Wagner could be, but he's so raw, it's just yeah. hard to know. But like to me, these are top. I mean, Oak and Lola's a top 50 player to me. Mm-hmm. Jagasaw and Freeling are easy top 100 players for me when you combine the potential. Like Freeling's more advanced right now than Jagasaw, but just their talent. They're easy top 100 guys where I only had one guy in last year's class as a top 100 guy, and that was Billy Shrouth. Yeah. So yeah. they were all top 200 ta- caliber, but to me, the the top level talent would be better in this group than last year. What's well, that? Uh, I was going to say is, you know, obviously you had Billy Shrouth, like you just said, it was a fantastic top 100 level player, but then you had Emil Wagner, who is, if there's a guy out of last year's class that's going to develop into that top level tackle, that's probably who it is for Notre Dame, right? In this class, if you get a Samson Okalola and you get a Monroe Freeling, I would argue that those two have the upside of being multi-year starters at offensive tackle. And I think it, obviously a higher, definitely a higher floor than a guy like Emil Wagner, in my opinion, right? Mm-hmm. And absolutely. So mm-hmm. there's, I think the talent up top is obviously a little better than last year. And then the depth, when we're getting into the depth, like if Sullivan Absher is depth in this class, right? Like that's a, really darn good class because he's mm-hmm. i mean he's a top 200 player in his in his own right top 150 yeah. by, by a couple of different <laughs> uh, platforms so like if that's your fourth guy you're doing a pretty good job yeah, at least. yeah. there's uh, and you could say that about B- basantis as well so exactly um, you yeah. know and if they were somehow able to get luke montgomery you're talking about charles jagas of being your lowest ranked of a four-man group <laughs> Right. So his, I personally would profile is pretty outstanding. Yeah, I would so. personally take him over Luke Montgomery and on three sports has him ranked ahead of Luke Montgomery. They're mm-hmm. the outlier. Most have him like in the 100 somewhere, 200s. Yeah. On three has him at like number 31. Mm-hmm. So clearly they, you know, they've got some weird rankings, but that's one that's like, okay, I'm not going there for his current ranking, but I say if he, if he reaches his full potential, that would make total sense to yeah. have him that high. Cause the upside is certainly there with him for sure. Yep. For sure. And I, I know, um, I obviously we, we didn't touch base on tight ends, um, in this group yet, because I, I, I don't, and I would love to hear your perspective on this. Mm-hmm. Obviously they have a commit from De La Salle tight ends, Cooper Flanagan in the class. I, I, I don't know if they stress it, to, stretch it to two. Do you think they take two in this class? I feel like they may just be, okay they don't just seem to one. be, they don't seem right. to be pushing for it. And I, and I right. think the fact that you've signed two tight ends in the previous two classes is, is, is reason for it. Now, sure. if you were to tell me that they're still recruiting Deuce Robinson, I'd say smart. I'd be up for a, that. He's yeah. a stud. I mean, he is a legit top 30 to 50 player and he's not even close to his full potential. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a guy that I thought they should have targeted from day one. and, and the th- the reason I personally would still recruit Deuce Robinson is he's that unique athlete. He is he would be the closest thing that Notre Dame has recruited to Tyler Eifert. And mm-hmm. what I say by that is, that, look, Michael Mayer is a better prospect coming out than Tyler Eifert. That's not I'm talking about the style of play. Deuce Robinson's a kid that you could literally line up at receiver in a lot of different looks. I mean, right now as a prospect, he's closer to Devin Funches than he is Michael Mayer and how you would use him. Would you agree with that as far as the collegiate yeah. level? Now yeah. he's more of a true tight end potentially than Devin Funchess was, but like mm-hmm. he's a guy you can put in the boundary and say, you know, we're going to put you in the boundary with with Jalen Brown, Cardinal Tate, and Rodney Gallagher to the field and say, have fun stopping us. Good luck, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're not gonna or Tobias Merriweather. I mean, pick a pick a guy. So mm-hmm. I would still recruit him, and I think that Notre Dame is going to be in a really good number spot this year. Like they're going to have it. They're probably going to take at least twenty five kids in this class. The way that the because there's 28 kids now, 27 now that 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 Tackus is gone. There's mm-hmm. 27 seniors, fifth years, and six years on the roster, mm-hmm. and you're already at 85. Now right. I think it's like 13 or 12 are, are the fifth, six year guys, so they're all most likely done. Then you have 15 seniors. I'd say five or six of them you may want to bring back, right? And then you look at it and say, well, you're going to lose some guys from your roster. You do every year. Everybody does. So you're talking about a 25-plus man class. You mm-hmm. can make room for a Deuce Robinson. Like, to for me, sure. he's the kind of kid, Ryan, that you recruit until he says, no thanks. <laughs> right? And then if he's if he's not interested, then you don't, you don't waste your time on it because I think Cooper Flanagan's a good football player. And here's the thing, too. I think Cooper Flanagan's more of a traditional tight end. Mm-hmm. I, I see him being an attached tight end. 
Yeah. Occasionally flex him out on a trip set that you can run some option routes with him, but he is an attached tight end. And they don't really have one of those in the previous year's class. Like to me, Holden Stace and Eli Raritan are, are very complimentary to each other, but they're mm-hmm. also both very modern tight ends. Movement guys. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Where I think you talk about losing George Takis. I think mm-hmm. Cooper Flanagan is more George Takis than he is Eli Raritan or Holden Stace from a style of play standpoint, which makes him a really good compliment to those players. So sure. if, if Cooper Flanagan's all they get at tight end in this class, cool. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, right. it's a good football player. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got he's got parts of his game to work on. It, it was clearly, he's a good football player. I just personally would never stop recruiting Deuce Robinson until he tells me not to to to, to stop calling. And even that, I'd find ways to <laughs> I'd find ways to reach out to him. He's well, just that. Good. The, yeah, and when in the in the piece I put down just Cooper Flanagan because I wasn't sure if they're going to stretch it to two, but Deuce was the other guy I had on my list. If they do, because like you said. I think that they can really work well off of one another stylistically, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like Deuce brings a little something that Cooper just doesn't have in his game athletically. I mean, let's mm-hmm. just be honest, but together they can create a really good duo. I think moving forward, if, yeah. if they were to, you know, obviously take Deuce or if they yeah. make a hard push for Deuce R- running back right, right now, back. they already have a commit Cedric Irvin jr. Mm-hmm. He's a very interesting kid. Mm-hmm. I am very curious to see what he does as a senior at a school that's actually going to let him run the ball more. <laughs> right. Because that's the thing is like he didn't touch the ball a ton. Like the way that him and Jalen Brown were used in games is like, who's coaching this team? Like, what are you mm-hmm. doing at Gulliver Prep? He has yeah. since transferred to Christopher Columbus High School in Miami, where mm-hmm. he's expected to be more of a focal point. I'm really curious to see because there's just the usage for him is so weird that's really hard to evaluate just how good he is. So right mm-hmm. now he's my lowest ranked kid in the class, but you see some flashes of some things that, Oh yeah, I, that looks familiar. I know a yeah. guy that used to wear a green and white uniform in college that ran a lot like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Talking about his dad, such urban senior who had a couple hundred yard games against Notre Dame, I believe in his career. So you've got him in the class. Do you push for number two back? And if so, who would be your, your top guy on the board? I, I do push for a number two because I think that Justice Haynes is a good enough football player or too good of a football player not to at least, you know, kick the tires with out of Georgia, right? Like he is a – he brings a little more dynamic element to the field that, you know, Cedric Irvin, the great thing that I love about him is that he is consistent in everything he does. Good vision. He's always going to, you know, maintain good discipline front side on zone and then hit the cutback when he needs to. He's always going to be a contact balance guy where he's going to not always going to go down on first contact. He's going to do the little things that makes you very high floor for a guy like a Cedric Irvin Jr. But I think Justice Haynes just brings a little more of a dynamic ability as far as short area explosiveness. He can really break. He can create some 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 um, explosive plays. I think that he just brings a little more dynamic element, which I why I think that him and Cedric would also be a really good complement together. Like I think that mm-hmm. they would mesh really well. So I would stretch I would stretch it to two. Absolutely. I would definitely kick the tires with Justice Haynes. He would be my top guy on the board because I just think that he has something that maybe Cedric doesn't have to the toughest degree. And I agree completely with Big Jim. Irvin is an incredibly tough oh Cedric Sr. was a tough mm-hmm. player, but so is his, yeah. so is Junior. Yeah. So is Junior. He's a tough he kid just as well. He doesn't get so. a chance to 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 show his skills is my thing. Yep. Is, now yep. I could I'm gonna I'm gonna be proven right or wrong when his senior film goes through because he's gonna touch the ball a lot more at Columbus. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of I've made my evaluation of him, but he is probably of all the kids in the class, the one I'm most open-minded to really doing just a brand new evaluation for him as a senior. Right. For the reasons we discussed, I agree with you. It's not that I don't think that um, Cedric Irvin's a good football player. It's just Justice Haynes is just, he's too good not to recruit. I mean, For just sure. Too good not to recruit, in my yep. opinion. And there's some other kids on the board I like, but Justice Haynes, I mean, I like Jade Lamar. I know you like Jade Lamar even more than I do. Yep. I, I, I think my concern is I think he's too much like Cedric Irvin. And that's my concern. They're very okay. similar players. Whereas Justin ha- Justice Haynes is somewhat similar, but more so he's just that good. Whereas yeah. I think Justice Haynes is, is in a level above Jay Lamar. Just my mm. my two cents. Yeah, no, and I I agree with that. I I would I would 
I would call Jaden Lamar very smooth, and I think that he does have some quick twitch to him, mm-hmm. right? But I think that Justice Haynes just has a little bit of a different gear, start, start. Like, I think that he has explosiveness yeah. to him. That Cedric has not shown. Correct. Correct. Right. Agree. Exactly. I would probably rank Jane Lamar ahead of just Cedric Irvin right now as prospects. Yeah. Uh, just because of the reasons we mentioned, but it's just like, he's too much. They're too similar. Like they're both like, I, like I see Cedric being a Kyron Williams type of back more okay. than a, you know, a, a big time back. Jane Lamar definitely is cut from the Kyron Williams cloth. Cause he can catch, he can line up in the slot catch and catch the football. Well. I mean, he is, yeah. he can be that kind of guy. And that's the thing I like about him. It's just kind of like, I just trying to put the scholarship numbers to make them work. I just have a hard time. If you're going to take a second back, I think it needs to be more of a, a high level guy in, in my mm-hmm. opinion. So we'll, we'll see how that one plays out, but yeah, let's, let's talk a little defense, Ryan. Mm-hmm. All right. So obviously this is the era where Notre Dame is further, much further down the road <laughs> in putting this class together. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously key number one is keeping who you have. You've got mm-hmm. to keep Keon Keely in the class. Yeah. I'm not worried about Brandon Vernon and Drake Bowen going anywhere. I'm not really worried about a Don. I'm not worried about a Don Schuler. I'm not super no. worried about Justin Rett, even though he's mm-hmm. told he's going to take visits. He just talking to his family and just he just he's a Notre Dame kid in my opinion in so many ways. Agreed. Keon Keely and Peyton Bowen, you've got are going to be tougher to keep in the class. That's mm-hmm. part of number one is keeping them in the class for the purpose of this show we're going to assume that they keep those guys in the class sure and we'll work with that let's start off with safety Mm -hmm. because it's an interesting one because if notre dame doesn't land another safety i think they're fine i do yeah but i think another safety is needed numbers wise Mm -hmm. and there's one guy on the board that is a game changer and a second guy on the board and, and i'm not sure if you're going to be able to guess who i'm thinking of there's a second safety on the board that if you miss on Caleb Downs, who's the number one guy that I really likes. But let's first talk about Caleb Downs, Ryan, because you and I had a very interesting conversation about him last night. This is what I love about having Ryan on staff. It's like same with Sean and Vince is we'll just sit there and text and just talk ball all day, you know. And yeah. Ryan was actually up a little later last night than he normally is. You know, normally oh, the one year old, it's like 9 30. I'm texting him, hey man, you up? And he's like, <sighs> you know, he's out. <laughs> but he was up a little bit later last night and we were talking ball. Caleb yeah. Downs is a special, special talent. And if we're talking about the dream class, if you have a dream class that doesn't include Caleb Downs, we are going to stop talking at that point in time because your dream, you don't dream big enough for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> what What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I, I wanna I wanna guess by the way of the the extra guy before you reveal him in a sec because I know you say you don't think I'll get him, so I wanna I wanna guess there. But <laughs> for me. You know, Peyton Bowen brings incredible athleticism, incredible range of the back end. Adon Schul, Adon Schuler, excuse me, brings a lot of just. I mean, he's just sort of like the Cedric Irvin on the defensive side. You know, he just brings solid everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like he does everything relatively well. Mm-hmm. I think that you take a swing now at a Caleb Downs, who is the younger brother of Joshua Downs, wide receiver out of North Carolina. And Dude, I told he wants Brian to transfer to Notre Dame. I mean, you know, <laughs> we'll take him. We'll take him. It's cool. It's cool with me. <laughs> Oh man, he's he's a fantastic football player. And I texted Brian this last night. I said, I guess this is a hot take. I'll, I'll own this hot take. It's I guess a hot take. Yeah, it's a little bit of a hot take. I think if Notre Dame is able to land Caleb, land Caleb Downs, Caleb's Downs, in my opinion, would be the top recruit in this class. Over I, Keon even more, Keely, over even Dante more than Moore. Keon Keeley. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I, I mean, honestly, I'm watching Caleb Downs film, and I'm just like, where is the hole, man? <laughs> What does he not do? He's not he's six got four, two twenty. That's the only knock <sighs> you can have on him. You but know? he's also still six foot. Like he's right. he's good size safety. Right. He's got incredible range. He's a great tackler, physical as anything. Could fulfill. I mean, I literally think that he could play nickel if you wanted. He could him play to. rover. He could start he could at play. rover for Notre Dame, and because you'd have more of a traditional four two five at that point in time, Ryan. Right. He's right. physical enough where you could put him on the second level out in space and be like. We're going to ask you to be a better covering version of Jeremiah Wusukorbo. I mean, Ro- am I wrong? Rover, nickel. No, I, I don't disagree at all. I think Rover, nickel, put him on the second level. On the third level is a strong safety, free safety, single high. I think that there's no, no limit to the impact. And I'm going to tell you something right now. If he was coming up in 2012, Notre yeah. Dame's recruiting him as a boundary corner. And, and, and he could do it. And he could do it. He could do it. I mean, he could do it. 
he is a he is a special dude. He is yes. a special dude. And a good kid, good grades, good student. He's a Notre Dame kid. It's just it's going to be hard to get him out of the South. Let's be honest about that. It's going to be hard to get him out mm-hmm. of the South. For but sure. You got to try because oh. if you could put him and and Peyton Bowen in the same secondary, mm-hmm. it's like, oh my gosh. Like that's just absurd. That's like that's Alabama, Ohio State when they were actually a really good. That's Miami, Florida yeah. type stuff, you know, from back when they were DBU. That is a I mean a disgustingly good secondary class. So if you're and it's it's realistic. It's going to be hard. Yeah. But he yeah. that he's been on campus at least I believe at least twice. He yep. came for a visit himself and then of course he was in town for the North Carolina game partly as a visit but also partly cuz his brother was playing in that game. Yes. You don't come up from Georgia for two visits if you're not interested in Notre Dame, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, uh, Keith just threw in, Ryan, do you have him over Dante Moore? Now, I would say, obviously, the quarterback layer to that, right, is that Dante Moore is a more important football player than a Calum Downs, potentially, right? But I just think for what he does as a football player, I would say Dante, I would say that Caleb Downs is the top guy because I just think that what he, I just don't see many holes in his game. I mm-hmm. think that he could be dynamic. I think that he could be elite football player potentially for Notre Dame or any other program that has him. And I think that's what also moves from a fit perspective is now that you have a Peyton Bowen in the class for Notre Dame, now that you have an Adon Schuler who are both very good football players, Peyton Bowen I think has elite traits as well. Yes. But you have those two baseline you can take a swing for the fences now with a guy like Caleb down and be comfortable. So to me, I think Peyton Bowen's ceiling is every bit as high as Caleb Downs. The difference between the two of them right now is Mm -hmm. Peyton is still a really raw kid that's super talented, whereas Caleb is super talented, but he's advanced. His game Mm -hmm. is very advanced. Uh, And that's the difference to me right now. I still, Keon Keeley is still the most gifted player in the class for me. If they get Dante and Caleb Downs, Mm-hmm. Dante is the most important because he's a important. quarterback. For sure. Keon is the most gifted. Caleb is probably right now the best football player of Fair. the group. It's kind of how yeah. I would say it. But if everybody pans out and mm-hmm. the NFL draft is not indicative because there's, you know, the, the fact that Kyle Hamilton's not going to be the number one or two pick in this class shows that it's about need. The fact that Quentin Nelson wasn't the number two pick, one or two pick and the 2018 draft, some positions aren't just aren't going to get picked super high. That's just the reality mm-hmm. of it. You know, Keon's a guy that that is could be, you know, drafted higher. But I think just impact wise, I think Keon's the more impactful player because again, the first level guy can have a bigger an elite first level guy can impact everything. An elite thir- elite third level guy can still be part of a bad defense if the rest of it around him isn't good. You know, mm-hmm. and that's kind of why I would go with Keon. But I just love the fact that we could have that conversation would be yeah. for me. But if you're talking about a dream class, it's got to include Peyton Bowen and Caleb Downs along with uh, Adon Schuler because, I mean, those are those are game changers, in my opinion, like absolute game changers. Yeah, Cornerback is next, and that to me mm-hmm. is another position that's a very important position of need. To mm-hmm. me, we got to set the bar at two. You need two. I think yeah. you can get away with only one but it's not ideal because there's so many kids on the roster. I think two is the number you target. And I think because they signed, you know, there's still three on the roster from the 2021 class. You signed two good ones last year. You start to get into a point now where two becomes the normal yearly number. And then if you get a third, it's because it's a dude, right? Yeah. Two is the number. I think the staff wants three in this class though. I I do. I think they want Christian gray. And then Mm -hmm. I think they want to get another dude. So when yep. we talk about the dream class, Ryan, mm-hmm. obviously Justin Rett's part of that. What do you think would be the dream class for Notre Dame and Corner? Yep. I also had three as the number for for just kind of the outlook that we're looking at. And I have Christian Gray, who you mentioned, out of the Smetton in St. Louis, Missouri. He's, I, I think, you know, obviously it was trending really well. And then we kind of hit, you know, a little bit of, I don't want to call it a speed bump, but, you know, just kind of got to navigate back to where we were. I think Christian Gray is a really talented football player. But for me, the top corner on the board, besides for obviously the commit and Justin Rett, and I actually think that this this young man is a little slightly more advanced right now, Malik Muhammad out there in Cal and um and down in Texas. I mean, he is 
when we're talking about Justin Rett, and if you missed our podcast that we did last Wednesday, we've been doing it every Wednesday. We talked about Justin Rett, and Justin Rett has elite tools, right? He's got the length. He's got the athleticism, the deep speed. There, everything's there. Malik Muhammad is an absolute dog at corner. He is a physical press corner who is only right now probably about 175, 180 pounds. Just imagine what he's about 190 and his play streak. You're on mute, by the way, Brian, but he is just a, a, I mean, we're talking about getting guys that could just get up in your face and just say, nope. We're done. You're yep. done. We're, he does we're not going not anywhere. Play like a 175 pound guy. He absolutely does not. He is the most no. physical defensive back I think I've seen in this cycle so far at quarterback yeah. as far as press. He is a he's a dog, man. He really yeah. is a lot of fun. Now getting Malik Muhammad in the class is not going to be easy. No. Uh, if if I if I was doing a, a real prediction right now, I would not predict him in the class. You're more optimistic on that than I am. And you've talked to him. So yeah. you know, people keep that context in mind. I'm going off mm-hmm. of just kind of reading the room and my experience and all these type of things, Ryan's talked to mm-hmm. him and feels really good about it. Not, not that they're, they're the leader, but that Notre Dame's in the game, legitimately in, it, yeah. in the game for him. For sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're talking about a dream class, he's it. I mean, he, in Brand, Brandon Plensner has his, I mean, it's, it's Rhett Gray, Muhammad, a corner, and then Br- Bowen Schuler and downs at safety. I mean, that Smart is man. it. I mean, that Smart is man. It. <laughs> and you look at that group, there's four top hundred players in that group. Yep. There's at least two five stars in that group, in my opinion, because I think Peyton Bowen's going to be a five star when it's all said and done. I don't quite have him there yet. I have him as a top fifty guy, but as we've talked about, it's all technique. It's just the technique's the only thing. That technique grade is the only thing keeping him from five star status. He's a five star athlete. Mm-hmm. He's got a five star frame. He's got five star production. It's mm-hmm. just you know being technical. He just doesn't fit into that mold. Now he will by the time he you know his senior year is done. For me, I, I'd be shocked if he doesn't. Yeah, but Caleb Downs is already five star. Justin Red, as you mentioned, is not a five star yet for similar reasons as Peyton Bowen, but the tools are there. And yep. Malik Muhammad is a is a top fifty player in my opinion. And yeah, you know Christian Gray is a top two hundred guy to me. I like Christian Gray. He he's a he's a Julian Love type of guy, not yes. an elite athlete, but just a really good football player. You know, yep. and a good athlete, but not an elite mm-hmm. athlete. What were you gonna say, Ryan? Well, I was going to say the fun part is that you can get Malik Muhammad, um, Justin Rett, and Christian Gray on the field at the same yes. time, right? Because Christian yes. Gray can work. In, I, I think all three of those guys could work inside and out to a degree, yeah. but I think Christian Gray, Taylor made in the slot if both those guys yeah. are what Notre Dame thinks they could be a corner if they're able to land them. Like it's I just Well, think and I think Malik could be a heck of a slot too because he's so oh, physical. Sure. He can reroute yeah. like crazy. He can run. Yep. I think Justin's the only one that projects as just an outside guy, but to your point – he yep. could, and we talked about last week, he could play both outside spots, in my opinion. He's mm-hmm. not just a boundary corner. He yep. could play boundary or field. And I agree with you that Christian and, and Malik could both play in the slot. Yep. And uh, obviously we've talked about how the safety group would go together uh, mm-hmm. and could play very well together. So that Absolutely. would be – I mean, that would be – I'll say this. Do I predict that this class is going to happen? No. No, I'm not going to predict that because – I'm a lot more confident that Malik Muhammad could end up in the class than I am Caleb Downs. I just don't see Caleb Downs ending up in the class. He's interested. He likes Notre Dame, but I just, he's going to have to come back again for me to feel like, okay, yeah, I'm just being honest. Yeah. But it's, they're in the game for all six of those kids. And mm-hmm. that's the encouraging thing. Yeah. And yeah. you've already got three of them in the class. Now you've got to hold our, on to Peyton to Bowen. top 100 players. Yeah. Like, yeah. Peyton exactly. Bowen's, I mean, and, and I have Schuler as a top 150 guy. Yeah. I think of and of those six, I would rank Christian Gray sixth. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a lot of years where Christian Gray's your number one or number two DB commit. I mean, in in recent history, yeah, and he would be sixth at best, fifth in that group right there. So that's a <laughs> that's quite a that's quite a, a deal. And you know, if you're gonna have a shot at Caleb Downs, I do think they've done some things that have helped them. Al Washington's mm-hmm. had some success recruiting in the state of Georgia. Chancey Stuckey is from Georgia. He went to Warner Robins. He's a well-known guy down in the state of Georgia. You know, if if you hire an Al Golden type at defensive coordinator, a big-time recruit, that may be where you have a shot, right? Mm-hmm. But yep. they're in the game, and that's the key. You know, and that's For all sure. you can you can deal with. Let's yeah. talk about Ryan. You had D tackle and D end as sort of two different groups, but let me uh, let me let me kind of. Put him. I'm gonna call a you know a little 
uh, owner audible here. All right. I want to sure. kind of put them together because I want to talk because I think the reason I say that is the way that you've described the guys that you want in this class. I think there's mm-hmm. a lot of interchangeableness to it where yeah. we've got to talk about it as sort of one group as opposed to two. Is that is that cool to do for you? Cool yeah. with that. So let's Absolutely. talk D line. Obviously, mm-hmm. Keon Keeley, Brennan Vernon must get you got to keep them right. You yes. got to keep them. Yes. And then after that, it's about, OK, I think you need two more guys in the class. Right. Mm-hmm. You can get away with three. But you can't get away with one. You can't sign six guys in two years in a row. I don't care how good those six guys are. You're going to mm-hmm. need some you're going to need a fourth guy, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about what your dream ideal scenario is when it comes to filling out this class with the next two defensive linemen. One should be no surprise at this point. I keep talking about the math of Catholics, Jason Moore. I, I, I mean, again, he plays defensive end. He plays on the edge most of the time for DeMatha, but at six foot five, six foot six, 270 pounds, he has the frame where he could be that Stefan Tuit type player, right? That mm-hmm. can work a little bit outside at times, but also four I, four, down to a three. Like he can kind of do a little bit of everything. And how he can mesh with the guys like a Keon Keely who works more early on as a Viper potentially for Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. Brandon Vernon, who's more of that strong side defensive end. I just think that fit makes so much sense. And even if you want to kick Brandon Vernon inside, you can still work Jason Moore and him inside on passing downs and obviously passing situations like in, in different sub package fronts. Like you can do so much with those players together, in my opinion. And then the other one, I, I just really like the fit. And I know he's not the most highly rated player in this class, but I just really like Devin Houston out of St. James School for Maryland as well, out of Hagerstown. Like I just think that. I don't know. I I don't understand why he isn't as highly rated as I, I think he's a top two fifty guy on one platform. But then there's a couple platforms I don't even think I'm ever rated at at this point. He's six foot five, two seventy five. He already is starting to really fill out that frame, right? Like he's a guy that has a lot of obvious. You know, I think he has easy projection working inside, and I think that he could be a three tech potential type of player as well. But I also think that he could eventually be a a one, like I think that at six four, six five, and you know, I think he could easily carry three hundred pounds at, at at some point in his career too. And I think that he could be that butt kicking nose. Like I think that mm-hmm. he really can. He's that type of projection for me. So that would be the two guys that I would most like. I also still get, like guys like KJ Sampson, who's a recent offer um down there in North Carolina as well. When Al Washington came came aboard and they offered him, and he's more your typical mm-hmm. one zero guy that's already six three, two hundred eighty five. Well, pounds probably going to play well over 300 pretty early in his career so that's what for me it would be jason moore and it would be devin houston combined with keon keely and brendan vernon in my ideal class yep now we have some people we have some people in the chat today that Uh are trying to suck up a little bit all right to us my man charlie weiss's belt loop is definitely doing that he says virginia and new jersey have some special talent if notre dame can lock those states down i'm a virginia guy he's a new jersey guy we're just messing with you alex but he's right <laughs> i mean and he's right and then david knight says the entire dmv has good talent and ryan i'm gonna have an article up from you this week that you wrote you wrote it a week ago i've just been kind of holding off on it uh mm-hmm. just trying to find the right time to get it in there because it's not like a time sensitive thing but the premise of your article is notre dame has to get back to being successful in the, the 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 DMV, but more so specifically, like really specifically, that yeah. DC Baltimore, Maryland. especially the DC yeah. Maryland area, that Catholic League in DC and Maryland, they've had some success from there, and the few kids mm-hmm. they have gotten from there, for the most part, have been pretty good. Not mm-hmm. all, but yeah. you look at the Sam Mustafer, Cam Hart, you know mm-hmm. they've had some success there. DJ Brown's been a nice, solid player from St. John's Collegiate, you know, nice rotation player. They've got to have some success in that region. And to me, that's also what makes Jason Moore and Devin Houston so important. That's also my dream, dream class is those two Mm -hmm. guys. Because I I think that to your point, Notre Dame could be a four down team with Keon Keeley at Viper, Devin Houston at Nose, and some combination of Jason Moore and Brett and, 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 um, Brennan, Brennan Vernon Herman. at the three yeah. in the in the in the 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 big end position, sure. And you know, to me, it's just like, boy, that would be one heck of a class. Because what I the thing I like about Devin Houston is he can play, he can play, he could two gap if you needed him to, 
right? Like mm-hmm. he's got, he's like what's 275, 280. He's got a thick body. Like he's going to be a yes. big, kid. he looks like what you did. He moves like to me, he, he looks like the modern nose. He's mm-hmm. like six, four to six, four and a half. He's listed as six, five. I don't know if he's quite six, five. He looks more so. six, four to me. So he's not too tall. He plays with good pad level, I think, mm-hmm. and, and the potential to be better. Mm-hmm. He can bend effectively. He's a strong, tough kid. He can play mm-hmm. that nose in the way that Notre Dame wants that nose to be played, which is, yeah, you got to play big boy football sometimes, but we want yep. you to disrupt because the, the, th- the theory that Marcus Freeman has had is there's nobody closer to the quarterback than the nose tackle. There's not a mm-hmm. defensive player on our roster that's closer to the quarterback than the nose tackle. So sure. why would we not use him to – get after things right yeah and and so to me Devin fits that mold really mm-hmm. effectively and mm-hmm. and the fact that he can play big boy football and of course Jason Moore is just a dude I mean he's, he's just an absolute dude yep. and you know we're 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 gonna have to debate if that class were to happen we're debating who's your number two guy Keon you know Brennan Vernon or Jason Moore and the fact that we would have to have that debate speaks volumes because in past years, that's, well, who's your number one? Is it, is it Brendan Vernon or Jason Moore? Now it's, are they two or three because yeah. of Keon Keeley? You know, look, college football changes a lot. It always evolves. But one thing has never changed in my lifetime. You mm-hmm. can't win consistently without elite play up front on both sides of the ball. Now, and and what I mean by that is you look at me, Steve Spurrier is a perfect example. Steve Mm -hmm. Spurrier won one national title, and he was a phenomenal coach, but they were never quite good enough in the trenches to beat Florida State with any consistency, right, to beat Nebraska when they played them for a championship, right? Like, you know, so they got that one title where they they won a rematch against Florida State, right? But other than that, and then Bama comes along, and and when Bama had that stretch, remember, with like – Eric Curry and John Copeland, remember that elite Bama front that just beat Florida up, you know, and mm-hmm. you have to, no matter how good your skill is, you have to be great in the trenches. And that's mm-hmm. been true since I was a kid in the eighties and it's true now. And if you can be great in the trenches on defense, it makes everything else around you so much better. And here's the other thing you talk about how, you know, how a guy like, Dante Moore can be sort of the Pied Piper on defense. I think the defensive line is that for the rest of the defense. If you can get a Jason Moore soon, keep uh, Keon Keeley in the class. I have no concern about Brandon Vernon leaving. Like To me, he is solid as you can be. He's one of the more solid kids in the class. you got to keep Keon in the class. If you keep Keon and add Jason Moore, now all of a sudden it's like, fellas, who doesn't want to play behind three top 50 defensive linemen? Right. Like, think about that. And that to me, that's the Pied Piper toward, hey, Caleb Downs, you can go to Georgia. You know what they don't have? Three top 50 defensive linemen. You can go to North Carolina and Ohio. You know what they don't have? Three top 50 defensive linemen. Right now. Or, hey, we have as many as they do. Right. Come do something different up here. Come be a legend up here. Don't be the next guy in line at Alabama. That's not be my pitch for Keon. Like, look, man, don't be the next guy, you know. You don't go to Bam and be the next, you know, Williams, right? Or the next whoever great player they've had, won your seventh title for Bam. Come here and be a legend by winning your first because people still talk about Frank Stams at Notre Dame, right? Mm-hmm. And Frank Stams ain't Keon Keeley from a God given ability standpoint. And that's the pitch that you can say, hey, come play with these dudes up front. Hey, Malik Muhammad, you want to be a great corner? Well, play behind this defensive line, right? <laughs> and I think. And, and the great thing is Notre Dame wouldn't have to, you know, create a booster program to pay off all those great defensive linemen to get them. You know, that's the other nice thing about it. Yes, that is shade being thrown at Texas A&M. But that, to me, is what I think they need to do. If they get that dream, that dream scenario with Devin Houston and Jason Moore, it hits mm-hmm. all the right notes. It's you meet your numbers needs, right? Mm-hmm. You've got your four. They complement each other incredibly well. Mm-hmm. And number three, there's a lot of big name, like high ranking stuff in there that makes it far more attractive as you're trying to recruit Anthony Hill to come play linebacker for you and Malik Muhammad to come play corner for you and Caleb Downs to come play safety for you and to convince Peyton Bowen, hey man, you ain't going to get this in Oklahoma, buddy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so um, 
I think those are the things that you that that why Jason Moore to me is the next big get that they have to get on the D line. Like to me, he is my number one target right now on defense. And when I mean number one, it's not that he's the best player on the board, but he's the yeah. player on the board that I think is going to commit the soonest, in my opinion. I could be wrong on that, but that's my opinion. He's the kid I think you could convince to to jo- join in the spring or early summer that then right. serves as a foundation to build upon. So that's mm-hmm. that's where my my dream class would be for that one, Ryan. For sure. Yep. And I, I'm on the, I'm on the complete same page. And again, I think that the ability that you got that the that Notre Dame would have now to if they were able to land a Jason Moore and a Devin Houston is the ability, like you kind of said, to work between a even and an odd man front and to have so many different possibilities and to sell the fact that, hey, we just signed the top four-man class in 2022 at linebacker, and we just signed Drake Bowen to play behind you all this year. Like, what linebacker also? Because you mentioned the corners, right? Who would want to play behind that? What mm-hmm. what linebackers would not want to play behind that? And I think it's a huge selling point, too. We talked about mm-hmm. the table setting of Dante Moore. Keon Keeley, assuming that he stays in this class, which I don't I, – right now I feel – great about you know i feel good about keon keely being in this class i'm not worried about it he is that table setter for me the Mm -hmm. defensive lineman as long as you can fit with him why would a jason moore not want to play with a keon keely it's going to take attention off of you you're going to get one-on-ones it's going to Mm -hmm. just open up so many different possibilities i think it's just it's fun to think about honestly it's really fun you know i'm going to be honest the the one position i don't think i could uh, we're going to move on to linebacker next and talk about a dream class. i don't think i could pick a dream class of linebacker right now that's also realistic Tough. like i Tough. mean we could talk about nicholas harbor but i mean uh, i'm trying to be somewhat realistic with the dream class of guys that i actually yep. think and kids never visited like of all the kids that we've talked about coming to notre mm-hmm. dame right mm-hmm. up to this point i think jalen brown is the only kid that I think that I've said is like definitely want to get that hasn't visited. Correct. Yeah. Justice Haynes yeah. has visited, oh. right. Mm-hmm. Dante mm-hmm. Moore clearly has Cardinal Tate has mm-hmm. Rodney. No, Rodney Gallagher is the other one. He hasn't visited. Notre Dame. He has not visited yet. You're right. He's visited after, after basketball season. Yeah, yeah. That would be about the only ones. Like most of these kids have, have visited and Rodney's somewhat new to the board, but like to me, when it yeah. comes to linebacker, like, and there's there's a lot of guys on the board that I I can't really get on because they like Anthony Hill. Sure, he's in my dream class. Sure, Anthony Hill, Hill Nicholas Harbor, and Drake Bowen. Sure, sounds good. That's my dream class, right? But like, <laughs> that's an unrealistic dream class, like for right now, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't know if I can give an answer to this one, Ryan. So I'm just gonna let you run with this one because I don't I don't even know what the board. Like two weeks ago, I'm being told they love Phil Pachotti. Now yeah. he's not a take right now. I don't know what happened there. Like I have no clue what's going on. I don't even know if they've necessarily figured out who they're going to push for. And then here's the final piece. They don't have a linebackers coach yet. Right, right. now, Marcus Freeman right. is there, right? That's not an issue. But until I really know who the linebackers coach is, I'm having a really tough time really, like, nailing down, like, who I would really, really want in the class, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, so, and it, it's – You crack it's, at it. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and the board is obviously very fluid right now, right? Like, there's a lot of movement that's happened, and we've seen a lot of recent offers, uh, you know, with with Troy Bowles down there at IMG Academy, and and uh, or actually not out of IMG, he's out of Tampa. Um, they offered another linebacker mm-hmm. out of IMG recently yeah. as Jordan well. Jordan Hall, right? He was Jordan from, Hall. From IMG. Yep, yep. He's a little bit of a bigger, thicker, like 6'2", 235 pound middle linebacker. So the board is expanding, and there's guys that have been on there like Tamir Robinson, who's a really talented football Jayden player. Jaden Osbury's I mean, been on there for a while. Yep. Right. Jaden Osbury, who's a really fast kind of run and chase type of will player. Um, but, and, and I mean, to, to go off of your, your thought process there, the dream cast, of course, would be Anthony Hill, at, <laughs> Mike, and right. having um, Nicholas Harbour at Rover. Like that would be sure. the dream. The, the sure. more and realistic. Then take a fourth yeah. linebacker and throw in Jaden Osbury, right? Like, right. Right. A, also a top 50 player. I mean, just, okay, sure. So I, so I, I went a little more realistic also with my picks. I, of course, Drake Bowen's in the class makes a ton of sense, whether he fits at will or Rover. He's a fantastic top 50 caliber football player, right? Like he's a really talented get kid in state kid too, obviously, which was obviously, you know, you have to get that kid when you're Notre Dame getting that type of in-state talent. I put, and I know that you just kind of highlighted right now, Phil Pachotti is not a take, but he would be for me. 
I really mm-hmm. like Phil Pachotti. Yeah. Like it, my ideal class is somebody that I think is realistic. I, not that I think Notre Dame is the leader right now, but I do think that they're within the top two to three, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that he is 6'3", 225, physical downhill striker, but he has, I think, some underrated athleticism to him. I really mm-hmm. think that he's explosive in tight areas. So he would be, like, if I'm saying Drake Bowen at will, I'm talking Phil Pachotti at Mike. That's my dude right there in an ideal world. And then mm-hmm. at Rover, I, I this is where I had Ronan Hannafin pegged on my on my board, right? Like we talked to uh, obviously Ronan is not committed at this time, but he is a a young man that is being recruited by Notre Dame as an athlete, wide receiver, could play on defense potentially, but he's 6'3", 205 pounds with room to grow, supposed 4'4 speed. I think that he is a really interesting football player could potentially play safety as well but i think an inter- really interesting football player potentially moving into rover obviously that is just what i like what i prefer and what my outlook would be but i think that potentially he would be a really dynamic player in that rover spot because i think that he just has the movement skills and the length that would be really really intriguing at that spot right now you're muted Dream scenario for me, Ryan, yes. yep. would be that I'm going to go a little different here. Okay. The one thing I will say is if Ronan Hannafin is forced to move to defense would be a dream situation because it means they just hit a home run at receiver. Sure. But I think with Ronan Hannafin, you just recruit him. What position do you – Coach, you want to play offense or defense? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You want me to play safety or linebacker? Mm-hmm. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just, he's a football player. You, yep. you, you, if he wants to commit tomorrow, you say, yes, we'll take you coach. Where do you want me to play? Let's figure it out, out later. We just know we want you another name. We'll figure out where we're going to fit you later. And we could submit, you know, if you want to play receiving, give you a shot, but look, be open. I'd be honest with him. Be open to the idea that if we really do well here, but maybe we can't get some guys over here, then we'll take you here. But if we crush it a linebacker and then we'll give you a shot, you know, just be open to that. Be honest mm-hmm. with him. I think if yeah. you were honest with him, I think he'd probably appreciate that and increase the odds of, of, of things going on. So I, I, I would take him and and just kind of say, what position do you want to put him at? I just say, just, you know, shoot dice and whatever it lands on, that's where you start him at. And then just let the depth chart figure out where to play him next or let the rec- rest of the recruiting class figure out what, where to play him next. And that's kind of how I'd feel there. There's a lot of talented linebackers on the board, a ton. It's just, mm-hmm. I don't feel good about where Notre Dame is with any of them right now. Just meaning just knowing where Notre Dame is right now. It's just, it's so early with a lot of these kids. Like a year ago at this time, I would have been like, yeah, oh, definitely Jalen Sneed's come to Notre Dame. Like, I mean, I was like, I was just now kind of getting into the fact that Notre Dame was actually, you know, may actually have somewhat of a chance with, with Jalen Sneed. I think if I remember correctly, I'm, I'm looking it up now. I don't think Jalen Sneed was offered to like, January like 19th or something like that last year. Cause if you remember when, when Marcus Freeman was hired, Jalen Sneed didn't have an offer yet from Notre Dame, neither did junior to Alamaca when Marcus Freeman was hired on, on um, what was it be January like eighth. Right. And so when you, when you look at kind of when the offer came, um, Notre Dame offered him. Yeah, I was, I was correct. January 18th. So at this time, a year ago, Jalen Seed had only been offered by Notre Dame for like two and a half weeks, right? He ended up in the class. And, and so it's so early with some of these, like like you mentioned, like Troy Bowles, so Anthony Hill. It's so early mm-hmm. in the process that I'm, I'm like, I don't think they're going to get those guys. But let's right. see who he hires as his defensive line, you know, his, his defensive coordinator line, and, and uh, linebackers coach first before I kind of dive into the whole, they have no shot there. Mm-hmm. So – you know that's kind of where I'm at, but that, uh, other than that, Ryan, I have I have nothing else really to uh, offer. Um, yeah. What I was yeah. going to say after after that after the 2022 get that you got as Notre Dame right with those four players, and then even going yeah. back to Prince Kali the year before, right. you're not you're not in a terrible situation if you go Drake Bowen and then maybe a secondary option right at number two even. Yeah, like you're it, in this good Ronan, spot. Even if it's Ronan Hannafin and Drake Bowen, Ronan Hannafin can play football. For combined sure. with Prince Colley in last year's class in yep. a three linebacker defense, I said like a third, but you know, this is what we didn't address. Two mm-hmm. is the minimum. They have to get two. 
Right. And I think Drake Bowen, to me, is one of those rare kids that could play all three linebacker positions. I think he's more of a a Will Rover now, but if you look at Drake's frame, he's going to be 230 and solid when it's all filled out, which means he's going to be bigger than the guy playing Mike linebacker for Notre Dame the last three years. Right. Right. And he's we talked about when we broke his film down. We did that two weeks ago. He has Mm -hmm. that two steps and thump type of explode, you know, lower body explosiveness. Mm -hmm. And so having a guy like that adds, it's almost as if you're kind of adding more than one player because you can kind of plug them in at so many different spots. And then a guy like Ronan Hannafin, you know, look, I, 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 is it, is it my dream class? No. Is it a class I can live with? Yeah, absolutely. Two really athletic kids that have some positional flexibility. And then mm-hmm. you get him in the class, and then you say, "Okay, let's shoot for the stars. Let's go, Anthony Hill, Jay Nosbury, and you know what I mean, and and mm-hmm. you know, and, and see what we can do, right? Sure. And, and try to yep. figure it out is where I where I would be with that. Ryan, right. I want to I want to answer two. I want to answer two of the questions that we had from the the uh, mailbag, and then we do have some questions down here that we'll yep. get to before we get out of here. But one. Uh, so one was from Seth Clark, 16. He said, how likely are Notre Dame going to get an offensive tackle class of Charles Jagasa, Chase Basantis, Sullen of Absher, and Monroe Freeling? We kind of already addressed that one earlier. Sure. And I think th- they're in it with all four of those guys. I think mm-hmm. I think if you take out Oak and Lola and you, and you replace him with Abs- uh, Absher and Basantis, I think it increases the odds mm-hmm. that they get that group. But I think they're in the game with all four of those guys based on what, you know, you and I have discussed, Ryan. Would you agree, disagree with that? I mean, yeah, it's a realistic no, I, class. No, it's a very realistic class. And in, in the article, I did kind of preface it by this is where I think they are, you know, from a kind of a best case to a worst case. So, I mean, just real quickly, I think Monroe Freeling, they're in a really good spot. I think Sullivan Absher, they're in a good spot. I think J- Charles Jagasaw, they're in a good spot. And then I'm not quite as optimistic on Basantis as it as it stands, Agreed. but you know he's Agreed. he's he seems to be a kid that's kind of you know letting the process play out. He's you know being very you know like let's just let everything kind of sure. develop in front of him. So that would kind of be my order of who that could leave him without say. a spot when it's all said and done. It I mean, could very well. You could. know, yeah, that's the other thing. The next yeah. question is from Cole Lewis. Am mm-hmm. I the only one who is starting to get worried about wide receiver recruiting? I feel like I haven't seen much about them being in the lead for anybody. And whenever we talk about wide receivers, it's only Cardinal Tate. Anybody else we feel we could snatch up for 2023. Let me just say one thing real quick. Sure. Uh, if you're on our board and you're listening to our shows mm-hmm. and you haven't heard the name Jalen Brown, um, I mean, we've talked about him for a while. We've also <laughs> talked about Rodney Gallagher a lot recently. Yeah. But – I want to just I want to just say like the the anytime you have a, a coaching change, mm-hmm. there's going to be a period of uncertainty, which we kind of just talked about at linebacker. But mm-hmm. now that Chancey Stucky is here, some of that uncertainty is starting to be answered, Ryan. And that's where I want you to kind of address just sort of the overall where the receiver board and where the receiver class is at this particular moment. Yeah, and I mean, we're, we're saying obviously the same types of names and and kind of in the article, again, if you want to go check it out in Irish Breakdown, I talked a little bit about the Dante Moore layer, right? Like that we keep talking about a little bit that's going to kind of jumpstart a little bit of the recruiting. But I, I think that they're in a solid spot for a few different guys. And I don't I, I don't blame anybody for feeling the way that they do because I understand that wide receiver is a very important need this cycle for Notre Dame, not only from a talent perspective, but also like we need some numbers, right? Notre Dame needs to get numbers onto the board. So I completely understand the hesitancy. I completely understand why people are a little like, oh my God, like let's let's get somebody on board. Right. I completely understand that. But Carnell Tate is the guy, right? Like he's he's somebody that Notre Dame is very much in it on. Things need to develop, keep developing, but they're in a solid spot. And I think they're in a solid mm-hmm. spot for a guy like a Rodney Gallagher, which we talked about, high school option quarterback out there in Pennsylvania. We talked a lot about Jalen Brown. They're going to have to do a lot about with Jalen because Jalen's a, a Florida kid, and you have to get him out of the South, right? You need to get him on campus like 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 uh, like Brian already said. He's one of the f- couple guys that we've talked about that has not been on campus at Notre Dame yet. So we need to get him to Notre Dame to feel really good about it. But there's a lot of talented receivers in this yeah. cycle, in my opinion. A lot of guys that Notre Dame is doing their due diligence on. 
Um, kind of the bigger body guys, like you right. kind of mentioned with Kyler Casper, and there's Braylon James and Rico Flores. Is a by kid the way, that with Braylon James, to. by yep. the way, uh, yep. remember that that's a guy that that Chancey Stuckey has already been recruiting for a while at sure. Baylor. Sure. So yeah, that that's that is good. one of those yeah. ones where he has a somewhat new re- Notre Dame offered him a while ago, but they weren't really recruiting him. So he's mm-hmm. still kind of new of being recruited by Notre Dame, but the guy recruiting him has recruited him for a while. For sure. Chancey Stucky. So I just wanted to make that comment as well. Yep. And then I will have an update soon on the site about Rico Flores. This, this evening, about five o'clock. It'll be up around five o'clock. Yeah. Yep. Around five o'clock Eastern time, it will be up on the site with Rico Flores, who is um who's out west. And he is a also a, a very talented player. He plays out in Folsom High School in California. Um, kind of does a little bit of everything well, uh, has a little bit of speed to him also. And no, he is very I, I will say that he's very open to the conversation mm-hmm. uh, for Notre Dame. And he's also a young man, sort of like Rodney Gallagher and Jalen Brown, that has not been on campus yet. And right. that is the other big layer. Like, let's get a couple of these playmakers right. to come to South Bend. And I think that that could also t- turn the tides, quote right. unquote, moving forward as well. And they went out and saw him during this last open period. Tommy yes. Reese for sure went out there. And I think another coach went out there with him. But I'm not, sh- I'm not sure if – I'm not sure if that fit the chancey Stucky time frame from when he was official or not. I'm not sure if Coach Stucky went out and saw him or not, but I know that Tommy Reese, I'm pretty confident saying that Tommy Reese did. Uh, and you know, so that that adds to the Rico Flores thing too. He reminds me a lot of Justice Lowe, the kid that I liked, may, maybe a little bit more juice than Justice had, but the, his his game, you know, six one. Mm-hmm. He's listed as six two. He doesn't look that tall to me. Looks like yeah. more six one, six foot and a half, six one. He's got some. He's got some vertical speed. He's got some once the balls in his hands kind of ability. He's kind of got that X. Like he, his game is somewhat similar to Jalen Brown's. He's not quite as explosive and dynamic as Jalen, but they play a similar game in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. And I think he's and a he's, he's a top hundred caliber ish type of type of guy. That's yeah. the other part too, though. Ryan is uh, part of the thing you have to understand is Notre Dame is big game hunting right now at receiver. Like mm-hmm. they could have a couple kids in the class right now if they wanted to. And, but it wouldn't be any of the guys that we talked about. It, it would, you know, they're, they're going after dudes right now. I mean, like, I mean, we, we, we talked about Jalen Brown, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he is a, he is a borderline five star kid. Uh, Rodney Gallagher is now a top 100 kid. Braylon James yeah. is number 75 overall on the composite rankings. You know, just kind of go going through these list of guys at receiver. I mean, these, these are, these are dudes. Tyler Williams uh, is a, a Cardinal Tate. I mean, is a, is a five-star recruit, right? I mean, that's the other Rico Flores is a highly ranked recruit. That's the other part of this conversation is they're not going after, like they're not recruiting against Duke right now for receivers. They're recruiting against Bama and Ohio state. Yeah. Tyler Williams is the low star, the low ranked guy at 255 from Lakeland, Florida. You know, um, they're going after dudes right now. Mm-hmm. And that this is a position at receiver that usually the dudes don't commit early. That's right. just, that's a, it's kind of the opposite of quarterback. And that's partly the reason. Because, yeah. Right. A lot of these kids are waiting on the quarterbacks to sort out because, you know, find out who they're going to go play with. So, it's um, cause and effect. It's cause right, and effect. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, when you're going after as many, big time players that Notre Dame is going after, it's mm-hmm. going to take a while to get those guys in the class for sure. And, and to just, it's, and, and then you throw in the layer of the position change. Mm-hmm. Let's give them a little bit of time here to fill this thing out and, and just see who see, the big, the next step for me is who commits to coming to campus. Those are the commitments I'm concerned about right now. You know, does Rodney Gallagher, he says he's going to come after basketball, but when does he actually ske- like, okay, I'm scheduled. I'm coming then. I think he said to you something about the blue gold game or did, uh, th- is that a different update that I read? Was that another, might've been another player. Must be I read so many else. of your updates. You've been sending me so much stuff. They all kind of bleed together, but you know, he's a guy that they're looking to get on campus, but he's a big time yeah. basketball player. I think he's averaging like he averaged, he's at, I think what I had in the the update that you put this weekend was like 18.6 points per game. Now he's at like 19, four last year kick him ball. Yeah. So, you know, his season's going to be over. You know, when, when does Tyler Williams come up? Is Braden, will Braylon James commit to visiting? Can they get Jalen Brown back on campus again? Right. I mean, those are the things that I'm more concerned about right now is because that's Mm going to really tell us who's serious about coming to Notre Dame or not. 
you know, Rico sure. Flores says he likes Notre Dame, but when he actually commits to visiting, that's mm-hmm. going to be a different story. And then here's the other one to keep an eye on. What kids are willing to come before the official official visit period? Because mm-hmm. those are the kids that have a really serious interest in Notre Dame. So when you look at kids that are willing to come up in March or April before the official visit period starts, mm-hmm. that's when you start to say, okay, that's interesting. Like, okay, yeah. what's that about? You know, and that 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 kind of tells you to start to tell you about what these guys think about Notre Dame. We're gonna get to your last question last, Ryan. Let's I want to get to some some <laughs> questions from the chat. Brandon Plesner, he has a dream class that looks very similar to ours. Mm-hmm. And, of course, uh, this is on top of the guys that are already committed. But thank you. He says, offensive dream class, quarterback Dante Moore, running back Justice Haynes or Jay Lamar. Offensive line, Monroe Freeling, Charles Jagasa, Chase Basantis, Samson Okunlola, be a heck of a class. Tight end, Jackson Howard. Wide receiver would be Jalen uh, Cardinal Tate, Jalen Brown, Rodney Gallagher, and Ty- Tyler Williams. Let me just say something right there. That is a really good receiver class. I mean, that is holy moly. That would be a, I mean, that's you talk about gap, a gap closing class. That's not a gap closing class. That is a gap erasing class. Yes, it is. That is, that is gap closed at that point in time from a recruiting standpoint, Brandon. So, yes, I absolutely love, I'd love that. I'm, I haven't seen if he did a defensive class yet. I'm, Ryan, are you able to? You're, can you go through the chat and see if Brandon put his uh, his defensive dream class on there? Yeah, I'd I'll like see, to I'll take a look. Yeah, I'd like to see that one uh, for sure. And, and get a couple other of these questions here. Uh, here's a, a, a clarification question for you, Ryan, from John Christophic. So yep. Expression you used. What is a phone book nasty guy? Oh, phone booth. Phone nasty booth guy. nasty guy. Yeah. So a guy that's going to play in t- in tight spaces, and a guy that you know you just don't want to get. You like a guy that you don't want to get into tight confines with, right? Because they're going to beat you up a little bit. Think of it as a an alley guy, right? Like a back alley, somebody that you don't want to see in the dark spaces, right? Like that's that's the kind mm-hmm. of guy that you just don't want to mess around with them too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Brandon really likes Tyler Williams. Really likes Tyler Williams. Fair, so good player. yeah, so we'll, we'll see if you have a defensive class out now. Um, but I want to get to yeah. some more some more questions here. We have a couple team related questions I want to quickly address. Uh, mm-hmm. Or actually, no, MGO Irish asks, uh, thank you for this one. Any chance we see an offensive play, skill player commit soon? Need to get the recruiting mojo going on that side of the ball. Uh, I, unless Ronan I Hannafin think, uh, is going to be a yeah. receiver recruit, I don't see yeah. anyone committing soon. And yeah. honestly, it's okay, as we just mentioned. Like, and I should have led that last segment that I just talked about with your question, MGO Irish, because I don't – I mean, look, it, would they love it if Cardinal Tate committed tomorrow? Yeah, they'd, they'd be pretty happy about that, right? That's mm-hmm. not that's not realistic. So they're not concerned about that right now. They are pushing for big time players. This is what we've always wanted, right? And so you have to accept that when kids commit early, they're going to keep being recruited. And you have to understand that some of these kids are going to be late in the process, guys, or later in the process, guys. You know, they're not going to be committing in in February. You know, it just it doesn't happen often. Now, sometimes it does. I mean, Notre Dame got Deion Colsey and and uh, Lorenzo Styles as juniors. Like they committed in basically the equivalent of what would have been October. But mm-hmm. normally when you're going after Lorenzo Styles is from Ohio and Deion Colsey was an unusual Notre Dame fit in Georgia. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you don't see many big time receivers that are kind of 4.0 students from really prestigious private schools. And when they are, they usually commit to Notre Dame pretty early, like Deion Colsey, Kyle Hamilton, you know, Tommy Trumbull type of guy. So um, just, you know what I'm going to say, Ryan, it's let mm-hmm. it play out, man. Just let it play out. <laughs> it so play we out. do have his, we have his dream Linebacker, linebacker class, class. yeah, that would be Drake time. Bowen, Jaden Osbury, and Anthony Hill. His mm-hmm. realistic one is Bowen, Phil Pachati, and Samuel and Pemba. That's a guy we didn't talk about. And, Pemba, and part yeah. of that is because I just Pemba right now to me is an elite athlete, and I just don't know yeah. where he's gonna play. Yeah, he's a big kid, man, like six like, four, two thirty. Yeah. Like he's he a can big play friend. tight end. He could play Viper. Yeah. He could play Ro- there There was there was a Rover. I mean, he could maybe grow into a Will. I mean, I just don't know where he's gonna play. Impressive athlete, though. Yeah, Impressive athlete, yeah. yeah. But Jaden Osbury's a good one too. Jaden Osbury reminds me of like a like a Jonathan Vilma type of guy. Mm-hmm. You know, just not the biggest linebacker in the world, but he can run and hit beyond yeah. what you would expect a kid with his body type to be able to hit. And then Anthony Hill is just a a dude freak. He's a yeah, freak. he's just a dude. He's pretty good. Here's an he interesting. Looks- Go yeah. ahead, Ryan. I was just going to say Anthony Hill looks like he could walk into the NFL next yeah. year. Yeah, I mean, he looks like a college yeah. junior right now to me. 
Uh, Demetrius Rex with a super chat. He says, Ryan, who's your NFL comp for Tyler Buckner? His is he, and then Demetrius Rex, his is Kyler Murray. I, I don't. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, obviously different size profiles. Kyler's a different arm type, right? The athletes different as well. Like, I, uh, I don't think I have a good one though. Like I'm trying to think like there's uh, Tyler Buckner's a pretty unique, unique. blend, right? Yeah, he's very unique. Mm-hmm. Cause he's, you know, he's like six one, but he's like thickly built and he can run and he's physical as a runner. Oh, I don't think I have a good one for that one. I, I yeah. just don't. David Garrard. Let's go. David Garrard. The old Jacksonville throwback there. Okay. There you go. There there you go. go. That's a, that's a know. real old one. Yeah. Didn't he play at East Carolina? I think, uh, I remember where he played. yes, I think so. It was definitely yeah. Carolina school. I think. Yeah. But yeah. he was, you know, kind of like a thicker build, nice athlete, not the strongest arm in the world, but a good arm, you know, like eh, let's go with David Garrard. I don't know. Okay. There you go. Uh, I think he'll be a better player than David Garrard, but the skill set <laughs> is similar. And that's what we're, that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about the skill set. We've always said, it's not about saying he's going to be that guy. It's about the skill set. And former, former, former Pro Bowl quarterback David Garrard. Yeah. How dare you, Brian? How dare you? Uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> let's be real. You know, <laughs> let's be real about the whole Pro Bowl after yeah. the monstrosity that we've seen the last <sighs> couple of years from that. Uh, oh, just yesterday it was just bad. like it's just kind of like bad. just stop. I mean, that's, some of the clips I'm like, yeah, that's why I haven't watched the Pro Bowl in a while. That I mean, yeah. just like seriously, just put flags on and have some fun playing flag football. I mean, just. Oh Christopher yeah. Morgan with Super Chat. Christopher, thank you very, very much. This is a team one. We don't normally address team stuff, but there's a couple that I think are really good. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, in terms of recruits, how do you think Ohio State will a uh, game plan for Notre Dame, knowing our new players, coach talents acquired when they only have our bowl game to go on, not including new coach hires afterwards with new looks, 245 days? Well... How does how will Ohio State game plan for Notre Dame? Defensively, it won't be a challenge. I mean, they, Notre Dame is going to still run what Tommy Reese likes, so I don't think that'll be an issue. I think it's just going to be about trying to figure out who's going to be playing where and you know how they may nuance it in some different ways. And but you know they kind of have an idea of what they're going to do defensively. I I don't think Notre Dame is going to come out as like this new like they're still going to run Marcus Freeman's defense. They're not going to come out in like some, you know, weird two, five, four defense or something like that. They're going to have an idea of what they're doing. So yeah. I don't think Notre Dame's a big mystery to Ohio State, just like Ohio State's not going to be a big mystery to Notre Dame. Notre Dame's going to have every defensive game that Jim Knowles coached last year. They've already got because they got Oklahoma State's film. And Ryan, normally they still do, you still do, like it's not like it used to be where you just do three most recent games. They still do all of them now, right? Like when you play late yeah. in the year, they still send all the film now, I believe. Mm-hmm. So they're going to have all of Jim Knowles' film from Oklahoma State, and then they're going to be able to evaluate Ohio State's film of their players and say, here's how we think those players fit into their defense. And that's exactly what Ohio State's going to be doing in Notre Dame. You know, like, look, yeah, here's some things we think they may do. Here's how the players fit into that. But – you know, it's like, look, we have to have a plan for number seven, right? That's, that's, you know, we may not want to pick on number five. We may want to pick on some of the other corners, right? I mean, they know who Brandon Joseph is. They coached against Brandon Joseph. They know what he can do and what he can't do. Uh, same thing on offense. Like, hey, look, 87's pretty good. Got to make sure he doesn't dominate us, right? 21 yeah. can play. So, I mean, it's just like any other opening game. It, 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 to me, I don't. I don't think there's these giant mysteries. I mean, Notre Dame's had a lot of coaching turnover from an assistant standpoint. Their offensive is still going to be the same, and their defense isn't going to look a whole lot different. It's still going to be the same philosophy, in my opinion, defensively. But it's a really. Yeah. I mean, it's a good thought, and we'll and we'll talk more about that specifically, Christopher, as we get closer and closer to the game. Do yeah. you have anything to add to that, Ryan? Yeah, and I would say it is a really good question. It's not so much about the new guys, right? The talent acquisitions. I would say two things that are going to be maybe on the forefront of the mind is defensively for Ohio state, right? Like obviously you have to defend more quarterback run game than you would, than you were going to have to, if if you're watching just the Ohio, um, just the Oklahoma state game, right? Like that's Mm -hmm. obviously an easy one to figure out. I think defensively 
or offensively for them. I think that one thing that Notre Dame did struggle with a little getting against Oklahoma State, which I don't think will be, I mean, I think it will be on the forefront again for Notre Dame, is that Oklahoma State's tempo was very quick, right? They run, run a lot of plays. They wanted to get up to the line of scrimmage. And I, I've heard some of the players talk about, like, we, you know, we, were, we were preparing for the tempo, but then once you get into the game and that tempo really starts to hit, that's a little bit different. So I think Ohio State might try to up their pace a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. They might try to get the get get the more maybe even a little quicker pace during the mm-hmm. game. So there's just a couple of nuances I think might mm-hmm. be a possibility. We had a question here from Keith Wiegand. What coach is going to be primary recruiter on the West Coast? I don't know who that's going to be. There's no natural West Coast person. No. I would I would personally put Dylan McCullough out there just because he coached at USC. He's been in yeah. the NFL. Yeah, uh, I think that he has the kind of personality he can kind of recruit everywhere. But at the end of the day, what we have to understand is Notre Dame is primarily a position recruiting team now, which is, I think, how you should be. Mm-hmm. And I think that they're, 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 there's two ways to have sort of a group effort. One is to have a regional recruiter and then the position coach and then the coordinator. The other one is just be a general team deal. So like the defensive lineman. So if there's a big time defensive lineman out in California or Washington, Al Washington's going to be there. Chad Bowden is going to be involved uh, as the, you know, sort of the the recruiting guy on on defense, and he may end up having a bigger role. Mm -hmm. The defensive coordinator is going to be involved in that. Marcus Freeman is going to be involved in that. You're going to, you know, there's all types of things. You know, you may have a connection to the tight ends coach recruited a guy. I'm throwing this out there randomly. The tight ends coach or Chancey Stuckey, you know, recruited a guy. Dylan McCullough may be involved because there's some connection there. I, you know, and and I think that's how they're going to recruit it. They're not really a, regional recruiting school anymore and and that's okay Mm -hmm. now there will be times when you'll have a guy with a connection that you want to take advantage of chancey stuckey in georgia that's one you want to take advantage of right uh al washington i've heard has some really good connections down in georgia take advantage of that Mm -hmm. but for the most part they're not going to be a you know this is your area just if you want a safety in texas then guess what the safeties coach the d coordinator marcus freeman everybody's got to be involved in that one if you want to get peyton bowen it's not because of the regional recruiter. It's because everybody, you know what I mean? It's, it's like Keon mm-hmm. Keeley. It's Dante Moore. Who's recruiting those guys? Everybody. You know what I mean? That's just that's just how it's got to be. So, and if you're not doing it like that, then, you know, it's, it's going to be a little tougher, right? It's going to be a little bit tougher. <clears throat> Savage Sci and Fitness says, Brian, what's your opinion on the news about our new running backs coach turning down the Giants? Anything you can tell us about it? Yeah, it's one of the biggest non-stories I've ever seen get reported as breaking news. Uh Ryan, you've you you've dealt with a lot in the NFL, right? I've been in college. Guys get get pursued all the time, and if all I did was report how many times a coach turned down a school that it was overtures, I would. That's all we would do, right? So the guy that Notre Dame hired to coach their running backs is still going to coach their running backs. I mean, you know, earth shattering news there, right? And then also there was Tommy Reese. There was a report that Tommy Reese was down in Miami and interviewed for the job at the University of Miami and turned it down. That's not accurate. He was not down in Miami this weekend. He did not formally interview for the job in that sense. He had mm-hmm. conversations with Mario Cristobal. Backstory there, Mario Cristobal interviewed Tommy Reese back in 2019. For their open O coordinator job tried to get him to interview again during the transition here uh, at Notre Dame this off season. And, and so there's a, there's a connection there. Mario Cristobal clearly likes Tommy Reese a lot. Tommy yeah. Reese likes Mario Cristobal as just about everyone else that I know that knows Mario Cristobal feels that way about Mario Cristobal. And so he listened out of respect, which is what you do. Sure. I mean, it, cause here's the thing. If the university of Miami is willing to offer me some money and offer me a job, I'm a, I'm an idiot from a business standpoint. If I don't at least listen, because then mm-hmm. I can go back to my agent or to the Notre Dame and say, look, I just got offered this amount of money from Miami. Like, I'm not necessarily looking to leave, but, you know, maybe you guys can. Up. I'm not saying that's what happened because Notre mm-hmm. Dame offered him a ton of money to stay at Notre Dame. I'm just making the point. That's why you listen. Sure. But, you know, never went and interviewed formally and didn't take the job, which should is not surprising. So that's that's those stories that came out about how Notre Dame coaches aren't leaving is a story now. So, um, yeah. So other than that, I don't have a real strong opinion on that. And there's a reason we didn't Break, report it. Breaking know? news. Tommy Reese will be the off the offensive yeah, coordinator. I know, right? Breaking news. Dylan McCullough is not leaving. Like, okay, sure. <laughs> okay. Then, 
All right, David Knight asked, do, do coaches feel obligated to bring back fifth-year seniors like, say, maybe they are not really needed? No. no. I think you always have a tough time telling a good kid that, you know, there's not a place for him, but most right. – you're obligated to do what's best for your football team and to win championships is ultimately the goal. Yeah. Brent Byers, who is obsessed with the recruiting rankings – I love you, Brent, mm -hmm. but he is obsessed <laughs> with the recruiting rankings. Can we, Notre Dame, land the number one overall class? Is it still possible at Notre Dame? Is it possible? Yes. Will it ever happen? I, I don't think so. You know who yeah. has never landed in a number one class in the last decade, Ryan? I'm going to give you a hint. Awesome. Team that, awesome. There you go. Don't even need yeah. to give you hints, right? <laughs> Look, there's a reason for it. For Notre Dame, number one, Notre Dame recruits a lot of northern and northeastern kids who yeah. tend to not be ranked as high in many instances. Number one. Number two. I mean, I just I think there's a bit of a the, like the South is where the best talent is and where most talent comes from, but I think it goes too far in some of these recruiting rankings. Sure. Um, there's just there's a lot of other reasons for it. The fact that Notre Dame tends to fill up early, and that mm -hmm. tends to result in guys' rankings going down. Like Brendan Vernon was a five star, Drake Bone was a five star when they committed. Now, even without playing any more football, you know, really <laughs> they've they've continued to go down in the rankings. So. I, yeah. I, I just don't put a lot of stock on that. The, what I'll say to you, Brent, is can Notre Dame land a class that I would literally be able to look around the country and say, would I trade that class for anybody else's and say, no, I wouldn't, right? Like as much as I love the 2022 class, it is a, to me, a top five class. There are other classes like, yeah, I'd probably take that class because that class has an elite quarterback, right? That's the one difference, right? They have an elite quarterback, but could it be possible that the 2023 class is going to have a class that I would not trade for anybody else's? Yeah. Does that necessarily mean that they're going to be number one ranked in a points driven system? I think that'll be tougher. Here's who I think could, and I'm not doing this. I swear to you, this is my honest assessment. This isn't like, this isn't spin. The one place where you may see Notre Dame with a number one ranked class is at SI All American. The reason I say that is, is because the way that they do it there. And, and is it is strictly about evaluating the talent, the need. It's a subjective sort of ranking where they actually look at it and say, we're going to choose the, who we think is the number one class as opposed to the points-based recruiting rankings. So that's why I think you could see it at SIL American, but I just don't think you're going to see it at the others just because of the way that the rankings work and where Notre Dame recruits from and all those type of things. I just don't think it's going to. It's going to be the case, Ryan. Do you have a different different opinion on that? No, no. I was I was going to pretty much side with you. I will just say that the the idea of being a little more subjective on the recruiting rankings, I like a lot more because that's even like when you're going into like the scouting side for like the NFL draft stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone just kind of loses their mind over numbers, right? But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, it's what you see, right? And that's right. kind of how you how things fit together. So I just appreciate that model a little bit better. Yeah, me too. I you, know, you don't did you meet your needs? Like like for example, if right. you're looking at Notre Dame's class, the I would take Notre Dame's class over classes I rank ahead of it at almost every position. But there's mm -hmm. one really important one where there's a huge gap, and that's quarterback. Sure. You know, so that has to be taken into consideration. Like, you know, I would take Notre Dame's linebacker class over anybody else's linebacker class, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. As much as I like, you know, Texas A&M, I look at Texas A&M's class and they got three stud tight ends. I like Notre Dame's duo better. I like Notre Dame's offensive line class better. You know, I, I, I mean, they signed one linebacker. Notre Dame is a way better linebacker class. But you look at Texas A&M and they signed seven defensive linemen. <laughs> you see, I get that right. Seven defensive linemen. Well, that and, and they're ranked super high. That's going to way skyrocket their rankings you know, to where it's like, it's this all time great class, but it's kind of skewed towards sort of one. This isn't Texas A&M had the number one class. Like, don't get me wrong. They yeah. had the number one class. Cause they had a good, but the point is, is like, there are areas where I can say Notre Dame's is better. Right. Mm -hmm. But here's where A&M, here's why, here's why I, A&M has a better class, way better quarterback. Mm -hmm. They didn't fall short of their needs anywhere where mm -hmm. Notre Dame fell short at receiver and their needs. Right. Like, look, I, Evan Stewart's a dude, right? Chris Marshall. I don't know if you've seen his film yet, Ryan. He's a big kid from Texas. He's really good. No. They got another four-star kid, Noah Thomas, really good. I'll take Tobias Merriweather over all of them. But mm -hmm. because you lost C.J. Williams and didn't add a third guy to the class and lost somewhere in Walker, you can't compete with them now because they met their needs, right? right. They mm -hmm. can match you at tight end, at best match you, and some could argue have better because 
you know, they met their needs. Notre Dame has a better offensive line class, but they still met their needs. They got four of them, right? Mm -hmm. Other than linebacker, they met their needs and then some where Notre Dame came up short at a couple really important positions at, sure. at receiver and in the secondary because you lost Devin Moore. And to me, that's, that's, that's what separates like that number one class. Now in 2023, if Notre Dame gets Dante Moore and meets their numbers needs everywhere, there may be classes ranked higher on the rivals or two, four, seven rankings, but it may not be a class that I would trade. Right. That, that does that make sense? Like, does that kind of explain yeah. where I'm coming from? I Absolutely. hope it does. Yeah. Yeah. It does. I hope it does. Absolutely does. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple more here. Uh, Justin Lamb, Lam, we went over the Tommy Reese situation. So yeah, we, we, we addressed that. He's not leading. Look, do I think it's a given that Tommy Reese comes back next year? No. It, it look until the Rams and 49ers name the replacements for their departed offensive coordinators, I'm going to be a little nervous about that. I, I just am. Do I think that they're going to go after Tom Reese this offseason? I don't think so, but it's concerning enough to where I'm like, let me pay attention. I don't see Tom Reese leaving for another college job. I just, I don't. I don't think that's going to be the case. And I think that is it for the uh here's draft one david solomon says i see that where kevin austin isn't included in the top 30 receivers in the draft uh any chance he could change his mind at this point and be able to come back for a senior year ryan i believe he hired an agent immediately correct yeah so as soon as you um the deadline was the 17th of last month to mm -hmm. declare and then once you sign with an agent you are considered now a professional athlete so you forego your amateur status right at that point so kevin austin is coming back there was a loophole that was put in but i believe that that is kind of been turned back to the other way where mm -hmm. it's just a done deal at this point and i wouldn't worry about receiver rankings too much right mm -hmm. now i wouldn't especially top 30s like especially mm -hmm. when it's coming from the media side of things like those guys haven't watched 30 receivers let's be honest right. about it yes correct um, so so don't so don't get too much over that especially if austin has a great if he invited to the combine if he has a great combine showing or if he blows up the pro day i i would not worry to, about where he is top top 30 receiver rankings right now. Miles Boykin would not have been a third round grade at this point in time coming out in 20 after 2018, correct? It wasn't Absolutely. until the combine that he blew up, right? Yeah. Um so, you know, that's that's the I mean and, and Chase Claypool didn't start getting late first early second projections till like right before the draft if I remember correctly from the yeah. from the, the the media side of things. So like Ryan said, I wouldn't put a lot in that. Now, there is a window still that you can come back to school. Seven Banks just did that. But yeah. you can't you can't have a you could you can't have hired an agent. And right. Kevin literally, I mean, when he he actually signed, I believe from what I was told, he actually signed before he actually like publicly declared. Like he did everything he needed to do to declare like yeah. behind the scenes. But before he like put his little I'm leaving thing out, he had an agent already ready to go. Right, so he's not coming back. And we, we've seen a couple people, you know, you mentioned, and Alex Pachuski, who's the right tackle from Illinois, just declared that he's coming back for his okay. sixth year yesterday. Like, there's there's going to be a couple guys that are trickling in, but those guys, like you said, have not signed to the dot in right. line with agents at this point. So I just I had to get you a draft question in, Orion. Love I just, it, man. Love I felt it. I felt like mm -hmm. if I if I didn't, I, it looks like we have a couple super chats here. So this yep. was his Brandon's dream class was uh, without the current commits, Jason Moore, Devin Houston. We saw the linebacker class already, Jaden Osbury, yeah. Pachati. And then he showed his DB class earlier. Downs, Muhammad Gray, uh, and then athlete, uh, Harbor or Mpemba. I mean, I would take that. Uh, <laughs> same. Yeah. I mean, pretty, you know, we talk about like, so here's the one thing I will say. If Notre Dame lands the dream class that we've talked about, mm -hmm. they could have the number one overall class. Mm -hmm. Because to get the number one overall class, you have to have multiple five stars. That's just right. a, it's a points base. You could be the number 32 player in a class and be a five star and the number 33 player in a class and a four star. And it's going to be a big, huge points gap, even though it's one player difference, but because one guy's a five star and five stars are allotted with. So like the way rivals works is if you're a, uh, if you're a, they have two grade, like there's a five star, four star, three star. But then within that, there's like, if you got a 6.1 grade, a 6.0 grade, and they're all kind of included, but then if you're a 6.1 grade, you get certain per, you get certain points. But then if you are ranked from one to whatever, you get points. And then from you know, it's like it's bracketed into like spots. So if you're if you're ranked 250, you could get 12 points. But if you're 251, you get nine points. So I'm like, you know, just 
throwing out random numbers. So that's kind of the way that works. But in this class, if Notre Dame got sort of the dream class, I think Dante Moore would still be a five star. I think Cardinal Tate would still be a five star. I think Keon Keeley would remain a five star. I think Caleb Downs would remain a five star. You'd have four or five star players. I don't think they would bump up Peyton Bowen just because that's how it works, right? Unless he's still taking visits in the fall and he's still a story and all that, they're not going to bump him up. They're not going to bump Justin Red up. They're not going to bump Brendan Vernon back up. They're they would. I don't think they would bump Jalen Brown into five star status if he commits to their name early. Now maybe late, that could be different, but. It would be a like I'll give you an example of how good this class could be. Ryan and I are talking about him doing an article about some sort of some sleeper players in the class. And we're having a hard time coming up with five to talk about because there just aren't a lot of guys that aren't considered really good that they're looking at. You know what I mean? Like, so it's like, I don't know if there's five, like we're going like Devin Houston, like two services rank as a four star. Like that's one of the sleepers we're talking about. Because they're recruiting some dudes so far in this class. But Ronan Hanneman will be on there. You never guessed who my safety – we never talked about this – who my safety pick would be if they don't get Caleb Downs. Because I do think a third safety is needed in this class. You want me to guess? Kid, yes. King Mac, St. Thomas Aquinas. You guy. nailed it. I love that kid. on. If he was two inches taller, he'd be a top 150 <laughs> player in my opinion. Yeah, he's got some range, man. He's oh, got some he's range. Good. I he love does, that yeah. kid on film. Uh-huh. Love that kid on film. He's just short. That's, I mean, that's like, well, he, short, doesn't, yeah. he doesn't have the, the, you know, the, the length that people like. Although I think he's actually got some decent length. I just think he's short. Yeah. I love King Mac. Love <laughs> King Mac. So, yes, I would take him in a heartbeat. Uh, he is a, a really good football player. I want to get down to some – got a couple super chats before we get out of here. Yep. Uh, somebody said, yeah, Austin has left the station, brother. Yes, he is. He is. He's not He's not coming back. Sorry, folks. <laughs> here we go. Mike Farino, Ohio State fan f- Ohio State fan here, found your content randomly a few days ago. I've really enjoyed it. Would a- also like to point out that Ohio State will have a completely different defense, so Notre Dame won't have tape on them either. Um, well, we talked about this, Mike, and that's a, a, a good point. They do have film on it. But that's what you kind of do when there's position changes, right, or coaching changes. Mm. Notre Dame has 13 – they'll have 13 games of film on Jim Knowles, right? Yeah. Notre Mm. Dame is also – this coaching staff has also – like, well, Tommy Reese anyway, has been on a coaching staff where they have faced a Jim Knowles-led defense at Duke, right? So what the the thing is you got to do now as a coaching staff is, okay, we, we know what Jim Knowles likes to do. We, we faced him against Duke. We didn't face him at Oklahoma State, but with all the film that Notre Dame watched leading up to the, to the Fiesta Bowl was of a Jim Knowles defense, right? So we know what Jim Knowles likes to do, right, looking at it from the Notre Dame coach standpoint. Now we have to think about, okay, well, how is he going to use Zach Harrison? How is he going to use, you know, uh, Denzel Burke? How is he going to use Ronnie Hickman? How is he going to use Lathan Ransom? Like, how do the pieces he inherits in Ohio State – fit into what he likes to do. Mm-hmm. And that's the key. But it's it's he's not going to revolutionize what he does. He's not going to – he's been a, you know, basically a 4-3, 4-2-5 guy, correct, at, Ohio, at Oklahoma State. He's yeah. not going to come out and all of a sudden be a 2-5-7 because of the personnel at Ohio State, right, or 2-5-4 <laughs> because of the personnel at Ohio State. So he's still going to be who he is. It's just going to – 5 seven. You're getting 14 yeah, yeah, guys so on the field. I like really that. good on defense. <laughs> well, the way they played secondary play last year, they seven guys still wouldn't do any good. But, uh, it's fair. Um, two, five, four. Uh, and, and so like you saw what I did there. I could do five, and then I added those two together to get the seven as opposed to subtracting from 11. I love it. Hey, um, I love it. The two, five, four defense. Uh, they're going to be still who he is. It's just – it's going to be adapted to fit the personnel. So – I would mm-hmm. somewhat disagree with that, just like I would disagree that Ohio State's not going to have some idea of what Notre Dame's going to do on defense, right? right? I mean, Al Golden's not going to come in and reinvent the wheel. They're going to still have a similar philosophy. It's just about, okay, what wrinkles is Al Golden going to bring to the table? Sure. And so I think that's a bigger question mark for Ohio State than what's Jim Knowles going to do at Notre Dame. Uh, so somewhat disagree with that a little bit, Mike, but both teams are going to have a lot to do because even if all the same coaches were coming back, every team is different. Every team – and if you're doing the same stuff you did at the end of last year, then then you're just not putting your work in because you've right. lost players. You know, there's no Kyron Williams. There's no Kevin Austin. There's, you know, there there's a new offensive line coach. There's no 
Kurt Heinish at nose tackle. There's there's guys that they're losing. There's no Kyle Hamilton on the back end of their defense. That's going to alter kind of how they put a defense together. It's going to look a little bit different. And same is true to Ohio State, right? I mean, yeah, they're look, Ohio State's going to be loaded at receiver next year, right? But yeah. a Mecca and some of these guys stepping in are different types of players than a Garrett Wilson or a Chris Olave. So you know what Ryan Day likes to do, but is he going to adapt a little bit some of his concepts to maybe fit a Mecca a little bit better, who's a, a bigger receiver than what Garrett Wilson and, and Olave do? That's the interesting thing about the offseason, in my opinion, mm-hmm. is – is kind of looking at it from that standpoint. So, but Mike, thank you for the super chat. And I appreciate you joining the channel. I have a lot of Ohio state members of my family, uh, members of my family who are Ohio state fans. And I love them anyway. I still love them, even though they have that (laughs) giant character flaw of being an Ohio state fan, but thanks for joining the chat, man. Mike Huff, Jake Locker is my comp for Buckner. I don't see that at all. Jake Locker had a cannon for an arm. Yes, he did. He was huge. Uh, he was just yeah. more of an athlete and he wasn't really like a runner like Buckner can be like he could run, but yeah. he wasn't a guy you were designing a bunch of run plays for. And he was more off script type of runner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and he was one of the most inaccurate college quarterback ever yeah. ever but man, and that arm think, was nice, yeah. man. That arm oh, was man. Fun. He, <laughs> when he, when he could do it right. Yeah. It was pretty. Yes, it was. It was kind of yeah. like what I've said about Brendan Clark. Like you'd watch Brendan Clark throw in practice, and you just see the ball jump out of his hand, and it explodes, and it's just mm-hmm. the tightest spiral ever. Like man, that thing's beautiful. What happened? Oh, it landed like twelve yards away from the guy he meant to throw it to. But like man, it looked really it looked pretty, pretty. You know, it looked pretty. Yeah, <laughs> um, that was Jake Locker. Like man, he throws a beautiful ball. Man, he hit the safety right in the chest, and there wasn't a receiver on the screen. But man, it was pretty. Uh, that would be that would be my thing. And he was also a bigger kid too i mean he was six yeah. three and like 230 know, so, something yeah, yeah. I, I i hope that he doesn't play like jake locker i don't because jake locker was really good in college but he would get you beat that yeah that's the thing about jake locker jake locker won them some games that they otherwise shouldn't have won because he he would just but he lost them a couple games that they shouldn't have lost to for sure uh, and i don't see tyler buckner being that kind of guy but yeah. but that mike's point is like that's kind of where it's getting a little bit challenging is it's just not a lot of guys. I, Kyler Murray is my comp for him just because he's the closest thing that you can find to a Buckner from a style of play standpoint. There are things that are different. Kyler has a much stronger vertical arm than Tyler does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tyler's bigger than Kyler was. But as far as the ability to be to be impactful from a designed running standpoint and escapability standpoint, and then also being able to sit in a pocket and pick you apart standpoint, I do think there's some there's similarities there. Um. It's just the arm strength is the biggest difference for me, right? That that's my big thing. But I think Kyler is the close is the closest one for me. He's a tough he's a tough one though, man. Like I really mm-hmm. don't have a perfect comp for him. Well, just, and I would have said the same thing about Kyler. Who was Kyler's comp coming out? I mean, the only person that you would point to, I guess, is Russell Wilson, right? Because of the body type, yeah. a little bit. He was like, a much more yeah, dynamic not... athlete than Russell was, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Russell's also a little thicker than he is. Yeah, and yeah. It's different. Yep. Very different. Yep. Christopher Morgan with another super chat. He says, I'm sorry. I meant with all the new coaches plus talent. Could we surprise them with possible new bold offensive play that they did not expect? I see it's 11 and one this year with our loss to Ohio state Clemson or USC. We still ball out. Go Indy. Sure. Sure. But I think, I think the same, it's a great point, Chris, but I think the same thing could be true of Ohio state for the reasons that I mentioned, because they're going to have some, some different body types at receiver this year than they had last year. And and they could do some different things, right? Like Chris Garrett Wilson was a dude. He's I mean, he dude. was a really good player. The mm-hmm. guys that are projected to replace him are like a Mecca Egbuka, really talented player. Marvin Harrison, really talented player. A Mecca 205, and he's a strong built kid. He's mm-hmm. a different type than Garrett Wilson. Marvin Harrison, 6'3", 205. He plays a different Long. game than than, than, than uh, Garrett Wilson does. Yeah. And Chris Olave do. So, you know, now the thing is we've seen Ohio State with both of those guys because those two kids didn't play in the bowl game. Yeah. But as we said at the time in a bowl game, you're still going to kind of be who you are that season. Mm-hmm. You know, especially since Chris Olave opted out so late in the process that I, I, you know, there's still a lot they can do. So I think you can make the case that Ohio state's going to be able to do some things schematically that Notre Dame's not prepared for, just like you can make the case that Notre Dame will. 
Uh, I absolutely think there's a lot to that, Christopher. I, I think that we're going to see – I think we will see a different look of Notre Dame. And and I think the the run game is going to look different. I think they're going to have some mm-hmm. different schemes. But it's not going to be so different that, like, Ohio State's like, whoa, what did we expect? I think the only thing Notre Dame could do that Ohio State's not going to be prepared for is if they came out early and just went fast. Yeah. Just tempo, tempo, tempo. And really get Ohio State on their heels – Actually, I think that would probably be a good idea, uh, to be honest with you. But I think that would be um, that would be my thing. Thoughts, you, Ryan? You got some thoughts on that before we wrap up here? Yeah, no. I mean, I, mean, I think you're. I think it's still you're going to be. You know, you're going to be consistent to what you are, right? Like you mm-hmm. said, we've already seen Jim Knowles' defense. Uh, I know it's obviously in a different place with a different, you know, different group of players. But I think you know, fundamentally, it's going to stay about the same. I think it is interesting though, as far as the wide receivers, because you mentioned like. Garrett Wilson was a quick separator, right? You know, Chris mm-hmm. Olave was a smooth downfield type of guy. Now you got, now you're dealing with some skyscrapers on top of Jackson Smith and then Jigba, who's kind of like that quick separator. So mm-hmm. very different, different skill sets that we're looking mm-hmm. at, which I think could be interesting. And then they're also losing a couple offensive linemen, right? So like need to mm-hmm. figure out, you know, they're going to be losing Thayer Mumford, they're lo- losing Pet- Nicholas Petit Friere. So need to, you know, I think it's going to look a little different. And they're going to have I, a new old line coach too. Right. Absolutely. Yep. So, right. so I think fundamentally, though, they're going to be the, the the basic same stuff, right? It's just there's always going to be some nuances. If you're not if you're not evolving a little bit each and every year, yeah. then you're kind of stuck in the past. So, right. This, this always happens. Yeah. So I make a comment about Al Golden, and like literally, like the next four comments, it's Al Golden for sure. I was just comment about Golden. I was thinking the same thing. Brian just rolling out Al Golden. Uh, is it Golden? I'm making an example. I'm using as an example. <laughs> Like, you know, come on, y'all. This that was not a slip of the tongue. That was I'm using an example, right? And this is why, you know, sometimes it's like it just makes I just want to not say anything. You know, it's just because this is kind of what happens. Uh, Father David says, I assume he was speaking from a standpoint of golden as an example. We have all heard mm-hmm. rather than confirming anything. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. It's an example. I mean, that's because he's one of the targets, right? Like just like Doug Belk. You know, talk about regional recruiting. Well, if you hire Doug Belk. Guess what? You're going to have a chance to go down into Texas and recruit some kids because he's been down there the last few years. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're going to talk about Texas. I would use that as an example. Doesn't mean Doug Belk's the choice. Al Golden has not been named the Notre Dame defensive coordinator right now. And it's not because he's in the Super Bowl. It's because he hasn't been offered the job yet and he hasn't accepted the job yet. Can't accept the job that you haven't been offered. Okay. It's as simple as that. As I've said before, Marcus Freeman is still evaluating four candidates right now. Okay. He's not in any hurry, just like he hasn't been the whole time. And you're not going to see a situation where five minutes, you know, so when the win, you know, if, if the Bengals win a Super Bowl, Joe Burrow, what are you doing? I'm going to Disneyland. Hey, what about you? I'm going, I'm going to Notre Dame. That's not what I'm saying, right? Like it's just <laughs> an example. Okay. So uh I would not break that kind of news that flippantly. If I yeah. knew that was going to be the case, I would be extra cautious not to say Al Golden if I knew it was going to be Al Golden. I wouldn't even mention his name. So I'm making an example because we're talking about putting a linebacker class together. Who's the who's of the four on the board who has a reputation as the strongest recruiter? It's Al Golden, mm-hmm. right? And so that would be a needle moving one. So when we talk about recruiting the West Coast, you know, you talk about an NFL background that would have some sway. So. Let's 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 not look for stuff, people. I, I promise you, I don't make those kind of mistakes. Okay, uh, I promise you that that's not the case. <clears throat> and then Charlie's trying to get banned here, so <laughs> 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 uh, but we appreciate y'all. But I think that's going to be it for today's show. A uh, lot. Of, I, I I did want to throw this up there to end this. Brandon Plensner says, this is the first year I felt that Notre Dame has a legit chance to make their real class full of dream class prospects. I would, I would say to end Brandon, I would say, I agree. I I want Ryan to just speak to this rule. I will say Mm -hmm. that this is the first year where there's a higher number of dream class prospects that I can actually see Notre Dame getting even guys. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think they're going to get Caleb Williams. Uh, I don't think, I I don't think. Caleb Downs. Yeah, I don't think yeah, Caleb. I definitely know they're not getting Caleb Williams. I don't see him getting Caleb Williams. Caleb Downs. I did it again. Caleb Downs. I, I'm not ready to predict them getting Malik Muhammad like you are. 
I'm um, not going to predict them to get Jalen Brown right now. I wouldn't pick Notre Dame as the choice right now. Uh, but I'm more confident that those guys are legitimate options now than I more of them than I probably ever have been, you know, and and that's that's the kind of exciting thing, you know. Mm-hmm. I think if you could pick three dream class guys right now that you definitely feel Notre Dame is gonna get, who would those three be? Uh, I would be Caleb Downs, not Caleb Williams, Caleb Downs. You definitely um, think they're gonna get him right now? Oh, definitely. I'm sorry. I thought you no, said no, no. who like me. Who who do you think right now oh. they the pick three that you think Notre Dame has the best shot of of your dream class Jeez. players? Jason Moore, mm-hmm. I would say Monroe Freeling. Um, I feel like I'm a bigger fan of than most. And then I would say Malik Muhammad to a degree. Okay. I'd probably have to throw Ronan Hannafin on there since he was kind of on our dream class options. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Freeling, I agree with. Yep. Definitely. Jason Moore, I agree with. Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, we're definitely there on those. Those are good. I, I, I think. And then Jagasaw would be the other one that I would throw in my I feel pretty good about category. So. I just want to. Remind oh yeah! Of- Dang it! <laughs> Darn you, Ken Pluto. <laughs> so, <laughs> here is the the stu- stupid question that Ryan chose to address on it. This is from Joshua Beth Bethay. Ryan, how does or rather did Brian stack up as a quarterback mm-hmm. recruit? Wrong answers only. <laughs> And the answer is, I want to. I want to make sure I get this this word for word here, right? So, because <laughs> jobs are on the line right now, Ryan. I just want to remind you. <laughs> the answer was, oh man, where is it? Uh wait, wait, wait. don't, don't. Uh, here, wait, thought I had it. Where did it go? Oh no, did I miss it? All right, I'm going to paraphrase for myself then. Uh, it's the on the answer, front page of the website here. I'll, I'll pull it up. I'll read your answers since you're I'll having a hard it. time That's so getting, nice. getting to the website. Uh, <laughs> so Ryan's answer was to that question, because he actually put that in the stinking mailbag today. Uh, <laughs> he says, on, unfortunately, I don't think they manufacture VCR players anymore. And yes, my film is on a, VC, is on a VHS film. So the world may never know. Rumor has it that he has a slight resemblance to John Elway in a six foot body. I have no sources to verify the trueness of that rumor. (laughs) So you kind of first started off with saying how old I am. Right. And then you followed up with the career to John Elway. So that kind of got you back in the good graces after. So you had been fired and rehired. At the by the time I was done reading that uh, that answer, for... I, mean, I, I knew I knew the John Elway would get me back on good graces. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so yeah, I, I I appreciate the question, Josh. That was fun. Wrong answers only. That was that was the the best part. So, um, okay, here we go. So Father David Penny says I I am my two year old daughter is watching with me. She claps whenever Brian and Ryan laugh. Can I get a high for Audrey? Audrey. Hi, sweetheart. Hi, Thank you for watching the show. <laughs> we hope you guys enjoy it, and we hope that you enjoyed watching it with your daddy. So thank mm-hmm. you so much for 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 on us. But bye, Audrey. Have, bye, have Audrey. a great rest of your day. Thank you, sweetie. So, <laughs> and everybody else, thank you all so much for joining us today. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. Share our podcast. Sign up for irishbreakdown.com, the message boards at boards at irishbreakdown.com. And as always, Make sure that you make going to irishbreakdown.com a port part of your daily routine to get all the latest for irishbreakdown.com. So everybody, Ryan, thanks for joining me today. Great show today, man. I enjoyed yep. that very, very much. And uh, we will talk to you guys again tomorrow on the Irish Breakdown podcast. <laughs>